Hello everyone, and welcome to This Nintendo Life, episode 227! My name is NBZ, and uh, my eyes are bleeding. Um, I am... I am. I have been glued to a screen of one kind or another for the. And it's not hay fever this time. No, it's it's okay, video game good. induced eye bleeding, all very much self inflicted uh, and self enjoyed. I would say uh, is is the crux of this. So I did some maths in the toilet this morning, Bal. You know, I take a while in the toilet. So um, I uh, I was calculating. Okay, since Friday at five p.m. when Xenoblade Three, uh, when I was able to play it, basically, I played like forty minutes over that lunch. Did break, it come but, at five p.m.? Um, did you say? No, it came during the middle of the day, like okay. the morning. I played like four. 40 minutes at lunch but really after work at around 5 p.m is when i really got to dig into it let's say 5 30 actually because the end of day meeting went long you know a bit of bit of time for that um so let's say 5 30 uh, on uh, on friday i did some calculating how many hours has it been since then and so it was like okay so it's been 40 hours since then we're, we're on sunday morning so yeah we're on sunday morning it's been 40 hours since then i then uh, subtracted the amount of time i've slept in that period so i got about 10 hours last night and then the night before was bad i only got six hours probably because of xenoblade um because i was too excited you slept for 10 hours last night uh, yeah i did i went to sleep early because i knew we had to wake up early to do this so i was like <laughs> you, I, I messaged you at the end of my yeah. shift with bally jr like right emmy zed get to bed yeah i was well asleep by that point so yeah that was falling on deaf ears i was already uh i thought oh he's not replied he must be in the middle of a xenoblade session <laughs> yeah yeah he must be fighting a boss right now uh anyway so uh that 40 40 hours subtracting 16 um that's 24 hours that i had been awake okay and able to play xenoblade of that 24 hours i have dedicated 17 of them to xenoblade chronicles 3 so um so that's where i'm at right now bali oh, yeah. that's that's uh that's my life currently and i'm sure we'll get into it but uh how are you doing how's how's things going over there. um i i'm just polishing my crown that i oh achieved. i see uh-huh. um i finally i finally won it for guys congratulations i was getting really annoyed because i was like i'm never gonna win it for guys because i checked back in i had some podcasts i wanted to listen to it's a good podcast game and the quality of one at Fall Guys has gotten so much better due to a combination of, I'm sure, the noobs just falling off, but also yeah. those who got into it are now much better at it. And I was like, I'm never going, I'm never going to win at this game. This is impossible. And it took me, if it, if it sounds like number of solo attempts, it probably took me like eh, 20, 24 goes to win. Um, okay. And then yeah, I got there and I posted the video on Twitter, and I'm, I'm incredibly proud of myself. Yeah, I mean, you did have a stroke of, like, incredible <laughs> luck to put you in the position to do it, but uh, you know what? That was the fourth final I got to in okay. 24 attempts, roughly, I think. Wow, okay, yeah. Um, and I and I, I was like, okay, this is, uh, this is, like, perfectly set up. You could fuck up here, though, because it was the one where you had to jump for the crown. And, like, the, the thing with that crown is it, like, it bobs up and down, and so, like, the distance... Why do they make it bob up and down? That is an awful decision. Oh, well, I mean, it's a... I, you know the type of game Fall Guys is it's exactly the decision you would expect them to make right just to add that like little chaotic element right at the end just so that if someone jumps and misses it it gives someone else a chance to get it right so there was still a chance you could fuck up but you did manage to grab it at the end and uh, yeah congratulations on that because um, that's a that's a tricky one to win that one I've won that one in squads before where like one person was like right in front of me on my team um, and they managed to jump and get it I was like right behind them but they were just slightly ahead of me to get it but it ended up uh, winning for the team which was cool but um yeah i mean i i played a lot of full guys at this point i'm like level 83 on the battle pass or something like that um i think i'm level like 26 27 yeah and i've not yeah. got the battle pass yeah i mean i think that's the thing is like because i paid money for the battle pass i'm like dedicated to actually finishing it so that i can get my my money's worth uh, if you will there's i have so many fucking costumes now though so i don't really know what to do with myself because i just have tons of stuff and the game really does shower you with that stuff if you if you go down that route which is pretty cool so yeah i don't feel the need to to ever spend money on Fall Guys again. I've got loads of costumes. I'm good. I can use the amount of um, currency I've got from this battle pass to pay for the next one if I really wanted to. So, um, yeah, or whenever I decide to kind of, like, dedicate myself to it again, which is fun. But, um, yeah. we, we got to get that team's win now. We do, yeah. Now that you're, uh, no, you're done with the solo, we can go for some duos and, and, and see how that goes. That'll be a good fun. I uh, Yeah, I, I stu- still very much enjoy Fall Guys, uh, and I think that game is, is great. It's but, very um, cool. Very cool. But we're going to talk about some other video games on today's show. Bally, what is the show going to look like today? going to be a two-segment show. We've got a lot of games to talk about. So the first segment, we're going to talk about all of those. And then for the second segment, we're going to talk about some emails. 
Absolutely. Some fun things people have sent in, and uh, yeah, you can send in more eventually, and we'll let you know about that when we get there. However, let's kick things off, Bally. Let's get into it. This is what people are here for. They are yeah, waiting. Mate. They uh, they have been bated breath for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, the third game in the saga. Um, finally come out. Uh, in fact, come out early, thanks to Nintendo deciding to just move the release date up for uh, reasons unknown. You've got Advance Wars to thank for that, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, potentially. I, I think that... Um, there were a lot of rumors that Xenoblade 3 was like done a while ago. I think mm. Imran had reported that it was supposed to get announced last year and then come out a little bit earlier. But obviously, I think COVID and everything has really just messed up Nintendo's schedule. It potentially got swapped with like Splatoon. Yes, yeah. I think that could also be an option because Splatoon felt more like a July game to me. And the fact that they said that was September um, after Xenoblade had originally got September and then was kind of shifted to July uh, made sense that they almost would have swapped them in a sense, you know, made, made sure that they kind of got everything lined up because Nintendo want to have something kind of like major every month uh, leading up to the end of the year. And that's kind of what we have at the moment with, um, you know, some exceptions like December. I don't think there's anything, but every other month there is like a big game or two, um, which is really cool. So Xenoblade Chronicles 3, um, I don't, where do I even start with this? I guess like if you're someone who's looking to jump into the series, does this make sense? I would say yes. Um, I think that these games, somewhat like Final Fantasy, are standalone in the sense that their stories are self-contained. Um, they will have references, though, to other games in the series. And I think this one, more so than any other, is very directly tied to 1 and 2 because it's kind of combining the worlds of both of those together, um, which is this interesting mishmash and... Um, like there are there are certain elements that i recognize immediately like in the first cut scene um and if you don't want spoilers for this maybe like skip ahead five seconds but in the very first cut scene um, or at least like one of the opening ones there's a shot of the city of alchemoth which is obviously from the original xenoblade it's a place where uh, you revisit in future connected um and i wasn't sure if we were going to see stuff like that because we we've seen stuff in trailers of like the fallen arm the giant digits from the mechonis like are within a landscape here there's also the the great Urian Titan from Xenoblade 2 that is seemingly frozen in time, as well as the enormous sword of the Mekonis that is, like, thrust into the middle of the landscape. So I knew there were elements of the previous games that had kind of been smushed together into this huge landmass coming back, but I saw Alchemoth and I screamed. I was just like, oh, okay, all right, we're, I'm, I'm, I feel like we're probably going to go there at some point in time, um, which is very exciting to me. So, like, if you are a Xenoblade fan coming into this, and from what the reviews have said, it sounds like they are going to give you the fan service you want, essentially. But that is not to take away from the fact that this is a brand new set of characters, a brand new setting, um, and a different world and, and kind of like narrative behind it. And I think the most fascinating thing about this setup is that these characters have 10 years to live, right? They are basically they're not born they're basically like created in a lab uh, and then they come out as 10 year olds so they're basically just like birthed as 10 year olds like created um and then they are just bred for war they're basically just born into servitude as soldiers um and from a young age they start training to become uh, killing machines obviously to to take on the opposing side uh, and these two sides are very clearly you know people from the xenoblade 2 universe and people from the xenoblade 1 universe so those are kind of like the overarching things but i don't think you need to know you know those previous games necessarily in order to get the most out of it because what they really do focus on are these new characters and their situation and the struggles they're going through i think it's a um immediately right within the first few hours i already care deeply about this set of characters more than i ever did for xenoblade 2 in the whole 80 90 hours i played of that game right because i think xenoblade 2 had this issue of it was leading a bit too much into anime tropes uh, in a way that wasn't good. Like, it felt like the characters never really... They never felt real. They never felt like they had, um, you know, interesting interactions with each other. Everything felt a bit forced and a bit goofy in a way that i wasn't there for right like they try and set up this relationship with rex and pyra and it's just like a little bit it doesn't quite fit you know it feels like it's forced it feels like there's there's no real chemistry there whereas immediately in this game you have these two characters noah and mio who are from two separate sides and they're clearly setting up a budding relationship for them and i'm like rooting for it i'm like i'm here for it like it is so subtle and well done and like the character moments they have and like the delivery of the voice lines everything is really really well 
put together. Do you think it's taking itself a bit more seriously? I think they kind of have to, right? When when the whole idea is that there, this entire purpose for people's existence is to fight and die for their country and to like basically return to the ether, right? And like there's there's this idea where if you live out your whole ten years, you go back to your queen and your queen holds a ceremony where you basically just evaporate into ashes in the sky and just like um, you know go off into the distance. So it is a darker subject matter, like just by its core premise, um, which means that yeah, they they kind of have to lean into that a bit more to make a bit more serious and as a result you get performances that are more in line with xenoblade one um and and the type of kind of quality of voice acting that i got from that game which is a lot higher i would say than the second um and i I think it really lends to its benefit um there's a moment early on with the main character noah where you know there's a battlefield and they've just fought in it and they have won the fight right and they have destroyed their enemies um kind of like you have the big mechs uh, again and these big mechs are basically they have these things called flame clocks in them which are like irises from an, an eyeball and everyone's irises also ha- have these flame clocks like built into them where they will fill up to like the halfway point um with the energy from the enemies that they destroy so killing enemies on your side fills up this clock which basically gives you the ability to to keep going essentially Um, and so you destroy the enemy's ones um, and you kind of take all the life force but all these soldiers on the battlefield um these uh, from the other side they they have no one to kind of like send them away to the afterlife they're kind of just like sitting there and so noah who is he's an officer which means that he's basically like a almost like a priest in a way but like he's someone who sends the dead off to the afterlife essentially by playing on a flute um and he he stand there and he's he he's very much like questioning this system right like it's it is an interest there is an interesting kind of class dynamics going on um kind of like those elements coming into it of this system who is really forcing this on us like why is this really happening and that starts to become more and more questioned as you go along and obviously like there's kind of like a, a reveal that um happens i'd say five hours in that when you kind of come together with both parties and they you know start to kind of realize a little bit more of what's happening here um but he's already kind of um having a lot of sympathy for the other side and so he kind of stands there at the end of the battlefield and you know sends them off uh, you know plays his flute and his companions are like what the hell are you doing like they're our enemy what you shouldn't be doing this um and you know they miss the transport to go back and then you kind of like start off on your journey um you know walking over these massive fields to to return which is very much a xenoblade thing but um yeah i think narratively it is really strong so far i felt very connected to the characters i think there's a fascinating world that they're exploring and like these ideas and and what's going on with this whole kind of like life energy thing um there are like elements that you can connect to the previous games but like it does feel very much standalone in that way um and and i love this idea of how the music is blending in with it as well because you have the flutes which are it's part of the gameplay where you will find dead soldiers as you're wandering around the overworld and you can basically just play them off and you'll you'll get like affinity level with the colony that's nearby um you know when you play them off because you're like helping kind of move their dead onto the afterlife um and uh, and they both have different flutes and the really lovely thing is that they play those flutes individual uh, melodies um you know when they're separated but when mio and noah because mio is also an officer so she's the same on her side of the fighting um when they both play them together the flutes create a different melody so like there's harmonization that goes on like the the melodies on their own stand alone but together they they work beautifully in concert and i think it's a lovely like thematic idea for what is happening here where these two sides from different kind of armies are coming together to create something um that is stronger uh you know together and, and working together so um yeah a really nice way of of putting that all uh, in context and um and and yeah i think so far obviously i've played a lot of it uh i've put 17 hours in which is an absurd amount how's like the world and the combat yeah so um so the world is interesting because it feels the least unique i'm gonna say from the previous games Quite and grassy plainy kind of thing or yeah well <laughs> Xenoblade has always had that, right? Like, you've always had Mm. those meadows, those fields, but they're always in the context of the Bionis, this giant creature that you're on, you're on its leg, right? And you can see the Meconis in the distance, and you can see, like, the head of the Bionis. Like, everything is within context of the world. And in Xenoblade 2, you're on these giant floating titans, and they have, like, really interesting geography, and the way that the creature is built is the way that the landmass is built. And this is basically just a big landmass. 
Which is to say, like, okay, I could be underwhelmed by that because it's, it's not on the back of Titans or, or, like, these giant creatures anymore. Could they reveal later that it is on the back of a Titan? I, who knows? Maybe it's a Terry Pratchett thing and it's been a giant turtle the whole time. Who knows, right? Like, it's definitely possible <laughs> that that's the case. Um, but I don't know if it will be. You know, it could, it could definitely be that. But because it is blending elements of previous worlds together, it feels like it's just more of a big landmass that you can kind of explore and i don't think that really takes anything away from it because it's still enormous and sprawling and filled with like interesting secrets to find and places to go like there are areas that you can explore uh that just feel like they never end right like there's just i look at the map i'm like oh my god i'm back to like my zone blade one days of like trying to fill everything in and uh you know doing the whole earth sea again of like when your character is walking they will fill in like some of the fog uh, of war uh, elements and um the nice thing is you can actually click in the stick and it has like a um an almost uh transparent overlay of the map so you can kind of keep mm. walking while seeing the map at the same time which is really nice um as a kind of quality of life feature but um i will i would think that in terms of biomes uh things have been relatively traditional so far and i'm interested to see where it goes because i know that xenon played especially i would say this probably feels the closest to x actually because x was just a huge landmass a huge planet mm -hmm. the cool thing about mira as a place though was that it was so alien like those spaces were so bizarre and weird and just had these super like massive verticality to it that was necessitated by the fact that you had a scale the kind of mech thing that you flew around the skies um and i think this has some of that but it's really interesting because i think that xenoblade has kind of become a bit of a metroid in a weird way um there are parts that i get to like there is a um there's a big kind of like overlooking cliff and there's this huge like vine thing that leads up to another cliff above it and this is like this purple vine and as soon as i walk up to it one of the characters is like oh i don't think we can climb that we don't have the ability to climb that yet and I look in the menu and there are like four different traversal abilities, which is really interesting because what Xenoblade 2 did is it had the system called field skills, which was frankly just badly implemented in every way. Um, uh, obviously, I was uh, chatting to Devon on Discord and he was obviously on the previous uh, bonus episode we did about the original Xenoblade. He's now playing through Xenoblade 2 and he's just telling me stuff about it as he's going through. And every time he mentions a, an element, I'm like, oh yeah, that kind of sucked, didn't it? Like there were a lot of like friction elements in Xenoblade 2 that were a bit annoying and the field skills were one of them where one of your blades would have to have an ability but to get these abilities you have to level up these blades through these quests that were incredibly agonizing and painstaking in terms of how long they took to do very frustrating but then also you would have to have that blade in your party in order to activate the field skill which means you have to go into the menu put them into your party do the field skill to see if you have the high enough level to do it and you might not and then you have to like take them out again and go away basically it was like gating in a way that was tied around this gacha system these specific blades it was really fucking annoying basically because you would get to a point mm. and you'd want to explore it and it would be like nah you, you have to go like a like an hm but more hoops to jump through oh way more yeah but like in a way that is so fucking frustrating where you would basically have to grind in order to get past that point and i think the streamlining they've done here is that clearly and i've heard this people have talked about it of you will get these traversal abilities uh, throughout the course of the story so they will just be given to you as you go through but what's really nice is it means that you get to go back to those previous areas and actually have like almost backtracking things to do where you can go back to those vines and climb up them i'm sure later in the story um there's these big kind of like ropes that i've seen that i saw in trailers like one of the characters like sliding across them um and i think that's another traversal ability that you unlock so it's cool to see these things dotted around that i know i'm going to get later and then be able to come back and, and re-explore um one of the frustrating things i'll say is it's super weird this hasn't ever happened in a zelda game before but there will be moments where it will just invisible wall you where it'll be like you try and go somewhere and it'll be like no we shouldn't go there yet we have to go another place and that feels mm. like the antithesis for what this series has always been which is like hey just go and explore to your heart's content even if there's a giant fucking level 80 gorilla man standing there he can kill you and you're just gonna have to deal with that fact right like the game has always been about that and so there have been some weird moments where that has cropped up i think partially for story reasons because you know 
there is a point in this narrative where like you and this group of uh, agnes soldiers all put together have kind of been ostracized from elsewhere so like the colony you start at which by the way the colony you start at called colony colony nine which is the same name as the oh, colony wow. in xenoblade one so um and it's it's very fun like referentially like when i first saw it it's much smaller but it's like almost mirrors it in terms of there's like a mini lake around it and there's a bridge that uh, you know goes across it to to pass to it um so you know little referential things like that that fans of the series will pick up on but um but yeah you're kind of ostracized from there which means that you can't actually skip travel to that location anymore and you can't like traverse back there so it will invisible wall block you until a point in the story when you can you know potentially do it again which i don't know if i'll, I'll get there or not um but i'm sure i will and um and yeah I, it just feels a little bit off it hasn't happened too much and i'm sure it will stop happening as the further i get into the game the more that it kind of you know lets me freely explore things but i did note it as somewhat weird that they would make that choice because um yeah previous games have not really dealt in that arena and it, it doesn't it doesn't feel good in a, in a game where you want to just have the shackles uh, released from you and just be able to explore to your heart's content so um that said though uh, i did come across a an area yesterday uh, this desert area where you know i talked to someone in the town and they're like oh but steer clear of that desert that place is dangerous i was like hmm interesting how about i just go and explore that entire desert which is what i did i basically ended up just like going around this entire huge desert it has these massive sinkholes in it it very much reminded me of one of the areas in torna um which was like a kind of like tropical area but it's, it's really really gorgeous huge and full of like a bunch of dangerous monsters um i was definitely under leveled for it but it didn't stop me in persisting because you know when you're exploring you're always getting the benefits of like bonus experience for finding landmarks and like you know it, it will just serve you better in the late uh, game because then you can fast travel to places um that you know if you've already unlocked them so i was kind of going around i was like oh this is a level 40 quest yeah i can't really do that at the moment but it was fun you know i really enjoy that aspect of xenoblade where they just let you loose and just let you even if it is a dangerous area like all right i basically spent three hours there just going around the whole thing not accomplishing a huge amount like leveled up a few times but um, it was mainly just for the joy of like exploration and finding stuff and i found a cave and this cave led to this like mini challenge where i had to rotate some kind of uh kind of circles around this thing uh, that opened up a door and then i got into a boss fight that were two elite enemies at the same time that were about the same level as me so it was a really tough fight um and yeah just going through this whole area eventually led me to this like secret overlook that gave me a bunch of experience found a new character um you know got a, a bunch of uh, rewards for it, a container with a bunch of stuff at the end of it um and it just felt amazing right like finding those little nooks and crannies going through and i definitely i'm not supposed to be there at the moment i'm like 10 levels above the recommended level for the main story um so yeah i'm definitely like not supposed to quote unquote supposed to be here but that's the nice thing about games like this is they generally you know apart from the parts where i've said it kind of blocks you off with invisible walls don't really hold your hand in that way in terms of exploration um which is really cool so yeah i've i've enjoyed it a lot uh, in terms of like the world and stuff uh, as I said, then you know there might be a reveal to come about the nature of this and how this all came together. They already almost tease it at the beginning of this kind of like collision that happened, and uh, but I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know, you know what is up with clearly melia who is in this game like and and seemingly a villain like it's just a weird situation uh that i i just want to learn a lot more about um i think combat is definitely the area where this game has a lot of improvements um and also a lot of complications a lot of things that make it i would say messy to the average viewer right if you showed someone a video of xenoblade 3 combat I think someone like you bally would immediately be turned off because of how busy shit is like just mm. trying to pass out what the hell is going on is a bit of a challenge I'm all up for busy shit if it's tutorialized well you know that's, yes that's my, exactly that's what i need and let me tell you bally they tutorialize it very very well and very that's clearly good um which is to say they start off very simply right you start with only three characters as opposed to six and you have a a set of arts that you can use now in Zelda 1 you had the arts bar which was like a bunch of them all across the line and you had to use the d-pad to go across and choose select them in Zelda 2 they they made it a bit simpler where every art was tied to a face button which made it easy access and also less of them so you had kind of less to worry about and it was more about like these combinations that you would chain together that you would kind of like build to these big combos and you would burst these orbs and it would do like millions and millions of damage xenoblade 3 I, I would say like kind of takes the best of both worlds where it doesn't have that kind of like chaining linking like combo system from the first game um but it brings back like uh you know chain attacks which have been in every game but also um you start with three different arts on the right hand side 
and those will cool down um, and kind of like link up depending on what type of character you are. Another interesting link to the original games, if you are a Keves soldier, so someone from the Xenoblade 1 kind of side of things, your arts will automatically charge up, which is the way it worked in the first game. If you are an Agnian soldier from the Xenoblade 2 side, your arts will only charge when you hit an auto attack, which is how it worked in Xenoblade 2. So like mechanically, they are bringing in stuff from those previous games for these characters as well, which is such a just a cool thing um but yeah it's the same idea of like building up um you know your your gauge by doing auto attacks and similar to two when you do an auto attack there's a timing based element to it so when your auto attack like makes contact with the enemy if you use an art at the time at which that happens you will charge up your meter more so your talent gauge which is kind of your big art uh, charges up faster if you get the timing correct and similar stuff happens if you pull off like positional stuff so noah very much like shulk and rex like has positional arts where a side attack will do more damage and a back attack will do more damage if you are positioned correctly to the enemy um, and again similar to what two had done it, it has an arrow now which tells you what direction you're facing because obviously that became a big deal in the first game was really hard to even know where you are and where you're facing um so there's an arrow that very clearly in indicates that stuff um and yeah it, it starts off simple but they kind of start layering on different systems into it by having stuff like um the class system right so you can change classes to anyone else in your army so noah if he wants to take mio's class on so she's more of a defender tank style character she, he can take on her class and then as he levels up in that class he gains access to those abilities that he can then use in his own one so if he goes back to sword fighter he can then have a defensive ability and these are on the left hand side so on the right hand side you have your own arts and on the left hand side you have arts that you take from other classes so it lets you mix and match in a way that if you want to have a sword fighter who can also use a healing art that's definitely a possibility um, although i haven't unlocked any of those yet because it seems like they're further down the chain um that's something that is really nice because it gives you a bit more flexibility as just that one character being able to do those those things right um and you can also switch in battle which is a new feature you can switch between characters and i had found so far that it's handy but i wouldn't say it's necessary um it feels like the ai works in a way that it will it will pull off the things you need them to right like when you break they will top for you then they will daze for you like they will do those chain reactions that you expect them to do which is very good um but there are situations like i was fighting a uh, kind of side boss like a harder enemy uh, yesterday and it was my second attempt at it and a bunch of my characters were on low health and uni who's the healer had put down a kind of healing area of effect on the ground so a lot of the kind of um, healing classes they have these buffs that they can put on the ground they're like circles where if you stand in them you get the effect of it so like tyon who's the tactician places down an evasion circle so if you're standing in it positionally you will take uh, you will probably get hit less because it's uh, upping your evasion similar with uni she can place down like a, a buff one that's like a power one that gives you more damage and if those are crossing over you can be standing in like the cross section of them and get the benefits of both at the same time really really cool idea um but uni one of her talent arts is to place down a big healing circle and i could see that all my characters were on low health none of them were moving to the healing circle so i was like in another xenoblade game i'd be like this is fucking stupid i'm about to die in this boss fight why, why are you doing ai but now i can just switch to those characters move them into the healing circle and then switch to the other character move them into the healing circle and then go back to the previous character i was playing as which was just like a realization that hit me of like this is it's just nice like sometimes the ai will not do what you want them to and you can kind of just nudge that in your favor uh, which really helps in these situations because you can get in some really tricky situations um and and health can go down quick and, and bosses can be very challenging i've said I, I i think i've found so far that the unique monsters which are usually the ones that are named like i don't know raging rotbart or like spiritual andy like they all have like a regular human name but also like a weird um kind of adjective in front of them unique monsters they usually have like uh, wings next to their health bar as well they're basically like extremely tough 
fights that even if you're a couple of levels higher than them they will still give you a run for your money basically and um yeah those have been uh some of the ones where you really have to employ a lot of these tactics um including the ability to merge together and to become a giant mech um which is a system called the ouroboros system um lots of stuff with like time in this game obviously very interested in that idea um the ouroboros uh the snake that eats its own tail obviously from like greek myth and stuff like that and uh the the infinity symbol is also used a lot but um these characters that you change into uh, they are basically like super powered versions of yourself where your arts don't have to cool down at all you can just basically just keep spamming them constantly um, but you have a limited time to use it until they overheat basically so there's like a heat meter that will go all the way to the, to the top and when it overheats then you can't use it for a while it has to cool down and there are various levels of that that you can build up by using fusion arts fusion arts is a thing where you basically have if you have an art from your main class on the right side and an art from another class that you've picked up from you know training in that class you can if they're both ready at the same time to use you can hold down a shoulder button and it will trigger a fusion art which will do both of those attacks at the same time and get you the benefits of both at the same time which is really cool but it also builds up this meter of the ouroboros so you basically can get a stronger version of the ouroboros using the fusion arts um and so yeah a lot of this sounds very complicated i will say that they give it to you slowly enough over time that it's it's easily digestible there are certain moments where it's like they'll give you a couple of things and it'll be like oh wait how does this exactly work how does this new hero operate that type of thing but um overall i would say it's a pretty nice easy on-ramp and if you do still have trouble there are really good guides out there there's enel he's a, um, a xenoblade youtuber who's a speedrunner as well i think he speed ran torna at gdq recently and he has done a bunch of guides so far i just watched his guide on chain attacks yesterday and that really helped going into that really hard boss fight of like okay well, well what is the optimal way to do these chain attacks what does all this really mean how do i build to like massive massive damage um and i don't think i'm quite there with it but i have a much better understanding now so there are you know really good youtube guides out there to help you uh, with some of the harder to understand mechanics and, and it's definitely you know if you've never played one of these games before it can be a little overwhelming i think me coming into it knowing a lot of kind of the basics uh, helps a lot for the on-ramp but um but yeah it's it's definitely um it's tricky i would say I, I like the combat a lot so far i'm not quite as in love with it as i was as i was with xenoblade 2 and i think it's just getting used to it and understanding it a bit better and um and the class system is interesting i i have not always been a big proponent of class systems i love it in dragon quest 7 where you basically it's almost like a sacred stones thing where you have like a branching path and you can like choose different routes to go down um whereas this is more like you switch to a class and it completely changes the character and you basically have to train them up in those abilities in order to unlock them and in certain situations it means like okay respecking them in terms of what gems they have equipped and you know what abilities they have on them but the nice thing is in terms of streamlining is that if you have say you turn noah into a um you know like lands lands is like a big heavy brute guy and he has like a defensive class if you turn him in into a defensive class and change all of his abilities and all of his gems and everything you can change back to the sword fighter and it will keep what you had previously and then next time you go to the defensive character again it will keep all your abilities as well which is like it's the type of thing jrpgs often get wrong like final fantasy 7 remake with the materia system i often found like oh I have to switch out this character then i have to redo their materia every single time it just wasn't it wasn't conducive to switching stuff out constantly whereas in this game it feels like especially with the gem system which has been refined from the first game in xenoblade 1 the gem system was essentially you had to have these two characters they had to have like good enough affinity with each other in order to create good gems there's also an rng element to it where you had to like do a little mini game and like push up the heat to a certain amount and then push it over to get a higher quality one it was you know it had a elements of it though just a little annoying and every time you wanted an individual gem you'd have to craft that individual gem you had like eight of them you could equip per character so it was like a lot of redoing the same stuff the way they've streamlined it here is that once you've made a gem you just have it permanently and you can use that same gem across every character if you wanted to every character could have the same one equipped you don't need to have multiples of them they just it just exists as a thing that anyone can have access to uh, and you level them up by finding materials it's so much more streamlined so much more simple um, and there's this other currency that's called nopon coin that you can kind of use to expedite stuff so if you don't have the materials but you have some nopon coin you can use that to get it instead um so yeah a lot of really just making everything so it, it feels like they looked at xenoblade 2 and they were like 
there's a lot of kind of frustrating stuff in this game. How about we just get rid of all of that stuff? And they looked at Xenoblade 1 and they're like, there's a lot of good stuff here about like exploration and like characters and stuff. And like, how about we do all of that stuff? So really, it does feel like the best of both worlds, ironically, when they're like both colliding together. Um, but I am in love with the game. Like, I, obviously, I've played it for 17 hours. I don't remember a time where I have been excited to wake up and just play a video game. I think Breath of the Wild was probably the last time where I was like, I just want to wake up and I, I go to bed thinking about it and dreaming about Not it. Power Wash Simulator. Look, Power Wash Simulator is great. <laughs> I love it. Um <laughs> you know there's something deeper you know with with these games because you're so connected to characters and you want to see what the narrative is going to say like there's already been a really interesting thing that i i knew about this thing before i went into the game but then they they kind of contextualize it in the sense of like well that doesn't make sense how are you this way when everyone else is this way uh and then like they talk about it in the game i'm like that is weird what is going on here like it really has as, as the first game did super well which is dangle mystery in front of you right like i think the best thing about that game despite how long it is is how well paced the story beats are to constantly give you a character chase to constantly have like another interesting weird thing going on in the background there is constant cutaways to like these weird shadowy people in the background doing stuff there is you know mystery being held but alongside that like moments of real like character you know interaction and like fun moments like moments where like they're jumping in this water and lands like all the girls are in the water and lands like dive bombs in the middle of them and uni calls them an asshole and you know like there are these real like bonds between these characters that are being explored in these kind of chill ways when they're like resting at places like when they're walking to places there's a lot of backstory as well which i was really fascinated by like in the trailers they showed a young noah but from the very beginning like there's a cutscene, like right at the start that's about 15 minutes long that is this entire thing that shows when they were younger and this fight they were having with um another kind of group within their uh kind of colony and um it's like a training thing basically and like it it shows like these characters have been friends for a really long time they have this you know, strong bond together but also is setting up like why are they the way they are now like why is noah you know the kind of person he is at this point in time what did he experience when he was younger to get him to this point um and yeah there have been a lot more flashbacks than i really thought there would be and mainly on the keves side at the moment there's not been as much of mio and her crew which i'm sure we'll get later on but um th there is that kind of sense of urgency as well because they're getting very close to you know dying essentially right like they call each year they call it a term um like a military term essentially that they're serving and uh, most of the characters have maybe one year two years left mio her her kind of they all have this mark on their body and when they're born quote unquote it's all red it's all filled in with red and slowly that red fades away to gray and so mio she now has this tiny red spot she basically has three months left um to live so it puts a time pressure on this story and like they've already talked about well it's probably going to take us two months to get to this big objective that we have so you can already see where things are going with that and, and like it really adds a sense of stake and urgency to it um that i super appreciate and i think is really 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 fun um yeah i'm absolutely in love with it i, I don't want to do anything else um uh, you know I'd, I'd rather be playing it than recording this podcast right now which rarely happens um <laughs> i love video games i really do but it is so rare that a game absolutely just fucking captures me immediately uh, and i should have seen it coming right like I, I adore this series i think it's so so good even the stumbles that i had with two like two has like one of the greatest soundtracks of all time it's fucking stellar and almost that soundtrack enhances the bad cut scenes right there are cut scenes where i was like kind of getting emotional into and i'm like wait why i was like oh it's all the music it's 100 percent the music the characters i really don't care about at all but the music is fucking nailing it for me um and i will say the music in this game is fantastic it hasn't quite hit the heights for me yet and you know my favorite uh, uh music in xenoblade games is usually related to like end game cut scenes and like climactic moments um the battle themes have been really good but i think like the overworld themes and stuff a lot of it feels like callbacks to previous games and it feels like almost weaving in like melodies and things like the melody when you i think when you find a location or when you take on a quest or something one of those melodies 
I swear is like a motif or a riff from one of the previous games. I can't nail it in my head at the moment, but it's, it's one of them. Um, so it does feel, again, like it is it is kind of marrying the kind of soundscape of those previous ones while having this real focus on the flute as this central thing. Um, and apparently they made, so the two flutes that the main characters have, apparently they made those real flutes and used those uh, to record the uh, the actual music in the game, which is which is awesome. Um yeah, it's it's very very good so far, and um, I I just want to spend the rest of the week playing it. Which good job I took work. I took a whole week off work, so I will be playing it nonstop for the next week. What was the last game you took time off work to play? Oh man, that's a good question. Mine's Last of Us Part Two. Yeah, I think I think I have done in the past with the intention to, and then I end up going to Edinburgh or something and not being able to. I think that happened for. Elden Ring maybe um I don't I don't think I took it off deliberately for Elden Ring but I basically had a week off while Elden Ring was like in the zeitgeist and I went to Edinburgh instead and so I kind of got behind on Elden Ring I think I might have actually finished Elden Ring sooner if I hadn't lost that momentum of like going away from it for a week or whatever um but yeah I, I don't know um this is I mean this is the perfect time for me to to play this and I am very very excited to just keep digging into it it's um yeah, it's been awesome so far. So, and yeah, I haven't even gone into other elements like the hero characters that you can get and like the rebuilding the colonies. So far, it seems like the side quests are much well, much more well realized anyway. Um, and like makes me want to do them. As I said, I haven't done a main story quest in a long time, uh, like eight hours or so, because I've just been doing side stuff that kept popping up and I found interesting enough because I just want to learn more about the world and what's happened. And as someone with knowledge of what happened in the previous games, I want to know how the fuck we got here. Like, that is so fascinating to me. I'm, I really, really am on the hook. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm in. So, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, absolutely phenomenal. I am so, so happy to be playing it and uh, doing nothing else but that. So, there you go. Very uh, good. Bali, you have finished a game that you talked a little bit about last time. And not a very long game, but uh, a seminal one, people will say. I finished up Portal. Yep. And... Yeah, people are right. That's probably one of the best games of all time. It's up there. I I think it's an incredibly impressive game. Um, I'll jump to Nick Picks first. Okay. And spoilers for like Portal, if you're unaware of like how that game kind of wraps up. Yeah, but sure. The f so I was unaware of the final quarter and how like you kind of escape the game as it were. And yeah. While I while I get what it's doing with the narrative for that part, it's, I do think it's the weakest part of the game, and that's. The, the reason for it is that what makes Portal so good in my mind are these clear, crisp, well-designed puzzles. And then when the game takes that away from you and you're left with like these muddy colored pipes and, you know, ventilation shafts and stuff, it's like, oh, wow, right, right okay, yeah, this game is from like 2004 or 5 or whatever, 6, was it, I think? I think and it was 07, maybe? 07, yeah. and you realize, okay, yeah, the, the clean-looking, crisp, white, blue puzzles look a lot clearer and nicer than these muddy areas and it's not just a visual thing but it plays into the mechanics as well because you're meant to like use portals to get out of this area and move on and proceed to the end of the game and because you're not in these clear clean rooms it's a lot less clear on what you're meant to do next and in not it's less clear on what it meant to do in a very kind of 2007 way where for the time it probably was quite clear but now in like 2022 it's like oh this doesn't feel good i was really enjoying the puzzles and now it's taken those away from me and i get that it's doing something with the narrative and you're kind of escaping the system etc etc i don't think those story beats merit the massive decline in enjoyment i had for the the puzzles by kind of taking those away from from you and I, I i did enjoy the final boss i think that's a cool finish but i personally really liked the you know the puzzles the, the actual mm. clean crisp well-designed puzzles and i can i could have just taken a little left the narrative as it were and just give me those puzzles because that's what this game is so good at and why i think it is just so good because those those puzzles right up until the end where sure the game starts with like yeah you move the cube and you have to jump on the cube to do this and but then when they start doing a lot more gravitational stuff and it's a lot about gaining momentum and then you're flying through the sky and then putting a portal just below you at just the last minute 
so that you then accelerate out of the other portal to get across gaps and up onto things and create because you, you go into rooms and you're like right the exits are way up there i'm uh -huh. down here there's like nothing to jump on how the hell am i meant to get up there and you realize and the game's very clever about like creating walls that you can't put portals on and there's very specific ways you're meant to beat levels which i just think is it's so so well designed especially for 2007 and i did think the final quarter was a bit of a shame in the way that it kind of takes all that away from you for something that i don't think merits that sort of pace change uh which i thought was a shame but overall i think it's just incredibly incredibly good i don't remember that section that much i think i remember the section where you're on that um kind of conveyor belt and glados is like we're going to burn you to death now and you basically have to escape yeah so that's how you enter that section because you're like right i'm escaping the game basically yeah pretty much i don't remember much after that i just remember the last boss and it was okay i think i it wasn't amazing but um the uh i, I think the interesting part about that is the execution right in terms of like you i think in puzzle games right you can have these situations where you know what to do but executing it can sometimes be a bit frustrating and um i definitely found that in portal there were moments with the momentum stuff that some of the execution felt not fiddly you worked out the puzzle but the execution is just that little bit too tricky sometimes yeah it's, it's like i think of the room where there are like three pillars and you have to like jump into one with a portal yeah, to jump out of the other that gives yeah. you momentum to jump down into that same portal but then you fling out another one and you... yeah they're really asking you to master that technique and yes. it's not the easiest thing in the world basically doing a portal mid-air to then move to another one to then yeah. move to another which was yeah I, I would say that's the the hardest part of that game for me in terms of like um enjoyment is just like getting that stuff nailed down how did you find that generally uh i could have done more of those kind of puzzles because i don't i never got too bothered by right you need this is the puzzle now you need to execute on that like i said more more of my frustration was in that pipes and ventilation shaft area and working yeah. out where to go next that does that area have like puzzles as well or is it mainly navigational and like narrative? mainly just navigational oh, okay. to be honest there's some there are some puzzles you get to like a room that's full of like uh the 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 robots that are trying right. to kill you yes. and you basically have to stealth all of them in the room mm. uh, and then you're doing like a big skill to get out of that room and there's a handful of rooms where it is but again these are like they're not designed in the same way as the puzzles in the start of the game they're, they're like very specific in what they're doing and yeah they're connected by these very like i said muddy brown ventilation shafts and pipes and you know behind the scenes of the game that you're not, you're not meant to see in theory right. um and yeah i just don't think those have aged very well they probably worked fine in 2007 and probably narratively in 2007 everyone was like whoa this is so cool oh my god but now in 2022 it's like well you've taken away the best part of the game for me <laughs> for me in this yeah. last quarter that's um, a shame I, I think it's a shame but i still doesn't it's not bad enough to take away my enjoyment i had in those first two thirds to first three quarters and i still right. think this game merits like it's you know crazy high rewards that it's received and things like that where i think this is genuinely one of the best games ever and i know people i think people prefer portal 2 right so it I'm depends I, th I definitely think that some people prefer the brevity the kind of like concise nature of the original game and i think the original game really takes that idea that core idea of what can you do with this one mechanic of portals to its nth degree right they really wring a lot of juice out of that one thing mm. what portal 2 has to do to account for that with a longer length and all that stuff is obviously a bigger focus on narrative so there's more kind of character interaction more of that stuff but also introduction of new mechanics so like portal 2 has like bouncy gel that you can bounce on and it has like this liquid that increases your speed as you move on it and that that type of thing so it introduces mm. other other kind of elements to um kind of make things a little bit different essentially um and portal 2 does have some of that out of bounds stuff as well but i would say that it's much more designed around distinct puzzles as well so you're going out of bounds but the puzzles that you do are just as good as the puzzles that you do okay. within bounds is yeah is, yeah kind of my memory of it anyway i played it a long time ago yeah. so and I, yeah. I look forward to trying portal 2 maybe this year maybe not but um yeah i'm a bit nervous that, that game's a lot longer and i kind of really did like the length of portal yes. like i think yeah puzzle games generally i think are so much stronger when they're that much shorter and right. the second you're beyond three four hours for a puzzle game in my view like I, it's got to be a damn good like narrative or mechanic to keep me having that 
level of engagement and i think portal wrapped up at the right time personally so it makes me a bit nervous for, for portal 2 especially as you say i didn't love the narrative of portal 1 and portal 2 has got more narrative so hopefully that does drive with me but um we'll see i think it's a lot better um there's like some fun twists and turns that happen in it which definitely kept me engaged uh and obviously you know because of my motion sickness i could only really play it an hour at a time so uh i i totally feel for you with that motion sickness because i'm like i, I mean i don't get motion sickness but i'm like wow if i did this would send me over the edge because this is a lot of like there's a lot of momentum yeah. stuff in that game do, do not get caroline to play this game right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you'll have a hard time i think um, um it's a lot but yeah wow portal i'm glad i finally got to it in 2022 i'm gonna must be the last person hey, to play this yeah, game but, yeah just about um it's definitely been worth the wait and another classic that i can proudly take off my tick off my list very good uh very very exciting to hear that and uh yeah at some point i will pick it up on switch and we can do that co-op yeah. campaign uh Population. which i have been waiting to do for a waiting long, for long a time decade to, yeah to yeah it's like when will bali finally get to the point where we can do this together uh that'll be great um so talking about uh classics from long ago um a brand new game uh to the west anyway came out and uh, i think we talked about live alive's demo last time on the show but uh the full game has been released uh it is it is hot jrpg summer right now you know it is popping <laughs> off jrp july yes exactly uh and um live alive is is the other one uh obviously it kind of has been overshadowed by xenoblade 3 um which is unfortunate but i think this game is really damn cool i it's like really it good. a lot uh bali you have picked up the full game now as well and have, have just started in it love to hear your kind of initial thoughts on live alive yeah i i was curious because i'd heard a lot of reviews and thought this is kind of doing a lot of things that kind of octopath traveler was doing and one thing that I wasn't a big fan of in Octopath was I think I would have enjoyed that game even more if I was able to just play play each character beginning till end right. and then moved on to the next character. And then if they all come together at the end, that is great. But one downside of Octopath is the game's relentless need to have the characters interact with each other. So you do one chapter here, one chapter there, one chapter here. You're bouncing around this map when in reality, I think that game might have even been stronger if you could just play as one character and do their chapter beginning to end before moving on to the next character. Right. And even if it was designed around just having that character and you, they don't meet up until afterwards. Yeah, I think that's also an, that has a knock-on effect of probably ironing out some of your issues with the grinding in that game. Too, so, oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. I think that's something they should really try for Octopath Traveler 2 if that ever happens. But this game basically does that. There's like you play as seven different characters in seven very different scenarios. And I prefer to play these scenarios beginning till end before moving on to the next character. And I even did this with the demo. I said like, right, MZ, what's the best of these three things I can access in the demo? What's the best? Said, oh, you, which one's the best? You said, oh, you should try the future world one mm -hmm. or the, the far future one. So, okay. So I played that and I played like 40 minutes uh, and thought, yeah this is really good i'm gonna buy the, the the main game and so ordered ordered it and then i've played i've put in the main game i beat the new the far future uh i've done the present day last night and i've just started um the prehistoric one or whatever i hear that's okay. like weaker so i'm like i'll do the weak one first yeah that was my least favorite one personally yeah and and i think that it is just i think it's it's too i think reviewers are guilty of just describing hd 2d as this one thing when in reality i think the art style of this is actually considerably different to octopath traveler and even different to triangle strategy as well right and even yeah, yeah. where i think that the lighting and the way that they render 3d objects and uses of stuff like bloom and stuff is very different and i think what octopath did works for octopath and it's a very fantasy setting and i like like that um but i also really like what live live is doing and like the, the the far future stuff like on the you're on the kind of like spaceship basically and it all just looks and sounds incredible and then doing like the present day stuff where it's like this combat s scenario fighting kind of thing and again it's very different but then there's like octopath they really use um orchestrated music in this really powerful way like for yeah. cutscenes and we, I was talking earlier this year about the unique way of the unique way to to tell stories using sprites, and and like re referencing to the moon, and that's something that I thought Octopath, Octopath did really well, as well as games like Final Fantasy VI and Earthbound and like 
I would include this game in it where the joy of HD 2D isn't necessarily the fact that, wow, all these 2D sprites suddenly look, um, you know, semi 3D. What I like is that telling stories using sprites with like th this almost cinematic level of orchestration is a very unique way of telling stories unique to video games that I think the HD 2D just takes it to the next level. Whereas mm. it, feel it feels very unique to say, you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake is a very different way of telling a story than say, I've not played Final Fantasy VII, but say Final Fantasy VI. Like yeah. this Live Alive feels like its storytelling is akin to Final Fantasy VI while still being visually and audio like musically more impressive and that's what i love right. about this and it, it takes it to a level that's above octopath in my view where they've just really nailed it and they kind of know how to do story beats and the fact that you have these bite-sized stories i'm fascinated what's going to happen after the seven stories yeah. come together um and yeah i'm only on story three out of seven but i am really enjoying it so far i also love that it's very so far it feels pretty light on the rpg mechanics and that's kind of kind of refreshing in this game where a lot of like, octopaths are obviously very heavy on them it kind of feels nice that like i'm not really worrying too much about levels and uh, strategy and there's obviously some strategy but so far the two two scenarios i've done have been pretty light on the mechanics and i'm sure the mechanics will increase and in, like that how often you, you use them but so far it's so cool yeah, definitely. And I think you've chosen the two ones you've played are like the two opposite set ends of the spectrum, basically, where the distant future is pretty much all narrative with like, you have the option to play that little Captain Planet game, right? Yeah, I did that a bit. And there's a boss at the end that is yeah. related to that. Um, but then also the um, the fighting one is pure mechanics. It's just pure combat the whole way through, mm. essentially. Um, which it's, it's, I think it's a good way for you to kind of get familiarized with, you know, how that grid-based system works as well as like yeah. seeing the kind of level of storytelling. So it's a good, I think it's a good way to start, honestly. Um, and talking about the presentation stuff, like one of the things I found really interesting is how they use the camera with these kind of areas in different ways to do like close-ups of the kind of environment and like sweeping shots through corridors. There's a moment in the distant future where they're there is this creature on the ship and it has been let, let loose and it's fucking terrifying honestly like i don't know how they that, achieved yeah. that but um it's scary uh and like they... the, this sprite based game is like one of the scariest things i've played this year yeah <laughs> it's just yeah, exactly. crazy the way they do that but they they kind of preface that by having these kind of close corridor shots where they're like slowly panning through and like like adding a level of cinematography to this that you don't expect because you kind of expect it to always be one angle one kind of like isometric perspective on um you know your your surroundings and it it changes things up a lot like the um the near future uh, section which is the last of the stories i have yet to do i've done everything except for the near future and that one when you go onto the world it, like it zooms out and there's this world map almost and you're like a tiny character moving around it as well like there's really cool different presentational stuff you know like in the fighters one you have a fighter select screen like you would in street fighter and stuff like that it it really runs the gamut in terms of presentation and style um that i appreciate a huge amount and um i would say that they vary in quality in terms of the storytelling and like what's happening like you said the prehistoric one for me there's no spoken dialogue they don't even speak to each other <laughs> like it's so frustrating yeah they just kind of grunt and they use pictures and images to kind of yeah. like get you along and, and the voice acting has been pretty good so far so like yes. to have a chapter that takes that away is like quite stark but right um i would say that that one from a kind of like uh i don't know narrative perspective has aged kind of poorly because it's very much like hubba hubba it's a girl let's <laughs> let's save the princess in distress kind of thing right it's yeah. like very much that type of uh, approach it's the kind of thing that if like square enix weren't a japanese studio they would have just edited out of the oh, game yeah. in some way for sure right. but they would have left you know, it in there yeah changed something um but yeah i i do i think that the interesting thing is like all these stories are kind of archetypical right like the space station one the you know the whole hmm. thing behind that is very much just alien kind of riffing on yeah it's yeah. riffing on like 2001 a space odyssey like classic sci-fi films mm. um the wild west one is very much like literally the name of the so each character when you start as them they have a default name that you can if change if you want to but i will stick with the regular name usually um so i just stick with the name that is given to them oh, after and, my vanilla heart <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I i like doing that in these kind of JRPGs, i do as well just to you know not confuse myself yeah because i could call everyone poop but that would be stupid right like i wouldn't know who anyone is um it would be funny for the uh the wild west one because uh they call him the blank kid and you can just and the default name is sundown so it's literally the sundown right. kid 
right like and he's joined by um uh mad dog like mad dog mccree there's a kid in the tavern called billy like billy the kid like it's very on the nose in terms of its filmic references and kind of the kind of narrative uh past of those types of things like with the um samurai one it's, it's a very similar thing like they, they very much lean into archetypes but i think it works i don't think it's to its detriment because the presentation and the way that they like approach these these stories almost as mini movies because they are like mm. self-contained like two hours long each they're almost like short stories like for a video game and you get the full like who you get the, the visual like director at the start of every chapter and then you get like yes. the full credits at the end of yeah. each one which is quite fun with the character designer and everything right. yeah it feels like you're finishing a full complete story almost um and some of them feel like they leave off as like oh yeah there could be something after this but for the most part they're very small self-contained narratives and um it makes me fascinated how they're gonna link but uh, same here yeah i kind of know i don't know how it comes together i know that they do come together and you will eventually have like a party made up of all these characters that you've been playing as the whole time but um i don't know how it comes together that's the interesting part um i i know kind of what happens after the seventh character which i won't spoil because that's something that i think people should find out for themselves but um but yeah i i really like each one i've done so far it does feel like it's great for you i think because you like have a, an evening gaming session of like a couple hours or whatever mm. after, you know um when you're looking after the kid and everything and um i think this this kind of structure of okay you know you can get through one of these stories a night is a really nice just. thing right <laughs> just just about yeah, yeah it depends but um yeah you can just about do it and uh yeah i think that has been a nice way to play this of like every day this week i had been doing like another one leading up to um you know trying to get to finish it before Xenoblade. i didn't quite manage it because i still got one left but um yeah i it's a shame because i would like to continue playing this but i'm just so much more into xenoblade that that's where all my time and attention is going to go to um i i will definitely be continuing with this but i i foresee uh, a point where you will overtake me in live alive because i'm just playing oh, okay. playing in xenoblade yeah. um but yeah I'll, I'll definitely be getting back to it and digging in a bit more but um yeah how do you feel about the combat so far because it's it's definitely different and definitely interesting there's no like there's no mana bar associated with stuff and everything is is built around this grid system where every time you move it like ticks up a ap meter almost yeah. um how have you found it and how have you kind of like navigated it at the moment i mean other than the fact i knew it was a grid system i knew nothing about the combat i just saw a tiny bit in trailers and was like oh grid system advanced wars fire emblem this will uh-huh. be and it's yeah. nothing like those no obviously. it's very it feels not. so different it feels a bit more live action in the sense that like by moving you are uh, 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 like time is passing and then one yes. bar will go up by moving so the enemy can attack just by you moving you need to be aware of that um i need to know what their sight lines are essentially like where can they aim and what do you need to look out for um, right exactly and i've worked out that there's a kind of a decent strategy is as long as you've got a move that can like knock an enemy back the energy they use to come back back to you means it, the, the turn order comes back to you and you yeah. can just keep hitting them away and so far the computer has been stupid enough where they just <laughs> want to constantly charge at me and i've just attacked 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 and often killed them and sometimes you like there's some moves where it's not all you don't always get the pushback it's only sometimes so it's not guaranteed necessarily but it's a decent strategy that i think worked well in the, the present day scenarios i faced and you kind of just have to learn each uh, battle on the hoof it feels like while there are some strategies that can pass over between different characters and different enemies that you're facing i think by and large you really need to learn your attacks and the enemy's attacks within that scenario more or less and kind of just strategize right i can heal up here but i need to kind of run away to heal up and it'll take them time to get to me and then i can charge up and hit them back and it's just kind of it kind of ebbs and flows a bit a bit more than i thought it might and it, i don't love it but i don't think it's awful and mm. i still think the best part of live live is easily like the fact that it is seven stories and it feels so fresh to go between the seven stories and the battle system is unique i am just glad the battle system's not like this really clunky complicated massive thing of systems to learn yes. because i think the game really the game feels like it leans a lot more on the narrative and the characters and it's even trying to do much with the mechanics which is a good thing for this game because i think that that's kind of, that kind of works with what it's going for especially with that like far future scenario where there's hardly if any battling you know so I, yeah I, I like it a lot 
yeah i i do think it's um it was weird to me when i first tried it in the demo because i was like wait there's no there's no mana like i can just use the most powerful move every time and it won't really restrict me on that which i thought was a little interesting the restriction is it takes longer to build up right That's it can do yeah can there are certain do. moves which have like a charge time there are certain moves which uh have a different range so like the weaker moves will have a shorter range but will be oh sorry the Maybe the stronger moves will have a shorter range, but the weaker moves might have a bigger range. Uh, yeah. and as a result, you can hit someone from all the way across the screen um, with a, a weaker move, but it just won't do as much damage. It's just you have the kind of positional advantage and you're further away from them. Um, I think it mixes things up really nicely. Like in the Wild West, you're a gunslinger, right? So you can only shoot in cardinal directions and diagonally. And you can't... Every single move is bound by those rules essentially so you're always like thinking about position of like okay if i stand diagonal to this guy he can also hit me at the same time so it's almost like a gunslinger face-off type of deal where mm. positioning yourself around enemies is really important and um yeah that one has this whole kind of setup um with like trapping the town and like kind of like making sure everything is like um you know prepped before this kind of big bandit invasion and stuff like that happens which is how did you find the present day like series of fighters to fight yeah i thought it was fine i didn't think i had too much trouble you get a lot stronger the the more moves you get which i found was pretty good so i i must have faced like the strongest guy first and it was a real grind of a battle so it must have taken me like 10 15 minutes on the one battle oh wow but i learned like some really impressive moves he's like i think he's the american guy i want to say the hulk hogan looking dude is he hulk hogan? yeah i think he's hulk hogan dude and i got some really powerful moves and i defeated most of the other enemies in one single hit <laughs> like, yeah so um interesting thing there i d- i was i wanted to be a bit careful about that uh because you learn moves from everybody right it never bit me in the ass but i know what you mean um did you manage to learn all the moves from everybody else as you were going through i learned hardly any moves from anybody else but the moves i did learn took me through to defeat everyone including the final boss yeah my only what so my only worry with that i don't know if this is going to play out is if if oh because if he plays that character if he plays that character in your party again later you might just not have very many moves because you haven't you hadn't learned the ones from this i mean i'm happy with the moves i've got it's he's he's still got a good range of moves i'm not yeah that worried okay yeah and i'm sure you'll be able to switch out party members so you might not end up using him but i just wanted to be because i realized that i was like oh shit i killed that person very quickly without (laughs) taking any of their moves you can refight them so you can do your refight after you've beaten them right i wondered why you could refeed up refight them obviously yes. so you can learn their moves except yeah. for the last person you fight so once you beat the last person you fight it will automatically move you on to the next thing okay and yeah. i i missed the very the very last move of the last guy that i fought so i've missed one of those moves which i was i was annoyed about but um so your guy's got like 20 moves yeah he has a lot of moves oh my God. um so yeah i basically deliberately uh made it so that the enemies would hit me a bunch to learn those so i could learn those other moves um which i just wanted to be prepared basically for later on uh but i'm sure it'll work out fine i'm sure you'll be okay Bally, and you won't have fucked yourself um it, it will be it'll be good in the end but yeah that's kind of the way that i approach that one and um yeah i i think that be be aware that i think the prehistoric one is bad for a few reasons but like one of the other reasons is that it feels completely unbalanced in terms of the enemies you fight you will come across some like pigs and you'll be like okay this is fine i can level up on these guys then a mammoth will show up just fucking run away honestly just run away because most of the enemies that you fight in this big area you explore they will just one shot you or two shot you and it's it feels like so completely fucking unbalanced that it makes no sense um it's it's just illogical in every sense of the word like there are these ostriches as well that will just like murder you straight away so i would say if you find any enemies that aren't just kind of the regular boar pig dudes that you can safely take out okay. just run away from them uh, and try and not grind but try and level a, a little bit up on those easier enemies because i found like that area it was just really fucking annoying because these big mammoth dudes like there's no reason to fight them because you do barely any damage to them and they basically take you out in two hits so yeah it felt very pointless Mm. um and unbalanced which is i i'm a little worried for like the later parts of the game if it if it leans more in that direction because i have heard some people mention that as having been a problem throughout the game um but we'll see I'm, i'm sure it'll work itself out in the end and yeah we'll be able to get through it without too much issue but um yeah i i think that live alive is excellent so far 
um very very cool little stories very fresh very very fresh yeah love it um and i would say like uh maybe maybe do the ninja one next as well because that one is a bit more deep in the combat probably some of the trickier combat so it'll get you a bit more used to it i'm gonna do prehistoric then ninja and then what the last three i should do and then i think i really like the imperial china one that one's really fantastic much more narrative heavy but also nice nicely balanced in terms of difficulty um the last one i've done is is uh the near future future one so uh, yeah i'd maybe save that one for last i guess it seems really cool so far from what i've played um and the wild west one you can just kind of put in wherever you want i guess all right but, um, but yeah the wild west one's a little bit shorter it's more like an hour and a half so you know if you want a shorter one that's probably the one to go for but yeah they're they're all uh really interesting and i'm sure next time uh we do the show we'll talk about yeah i'll try and finish it up for next time but yeah it might be tight i think it's like 21 hours on how long to be in this like i mean for wow. an rpg what a beautiful length right yeah. you know um if if i had been playing that at the same rate i've been playing xenoblade i'd be almost done with it probably by this point so uh but of course very different experiences very different yeah. kind of pacing and everything so um awesome uh look forward to chatting more about live alive next time but bally you have finally got around to uh, a game i've been bugging you to play for a while oh, just i'm getting i'm plowing through the games that you're recommending to me i mean they're like go to play this game go to play this game go to, to the moon you know mm-hmm. been nagging about portal for a while yeah. and i'm going to play bayonetta 2 this year but i've also that's contractually obligated, that's contractually uh, to, obligated. because of our uh our whole yeah. segment on it but yes but i've i'm i've now played high plight drifter which yeah. is a game you reference like i swear every time we've played you know like a tunic or an unsighted uh-huh. or a Death Street. Oh, yeah, Hyperlight Drifter. That's the one. Yes. That, that was the original. That's the real. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, so I finally played Hyperlight Drifter, and yeah, it's a it's a great game. It's a very good game. Uh, I'll I'll go with the nitpicks first. Of course, like yeah. Those Get out them out the way. way. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I think the game's got some navigational issues. Like I think the map is incredibly difficult to read and understand. It right. kind of does like the unsighted thing where it's got like the main level and then like a the tunnel level. So you yeah, got it's like an underground system, underground. Right? tunnels that link and things and you need four doodads from each area to get to the final boss Mm. but in each area there's also four hidden doodads that are optional but if you get one of the hidden doodads you can also use that as one of the main doodads to get to the final boss ah okay um so in the first the first area was fine it was very very linear the second area, and I should say that the four areas, other than the first area and the last area, you can do the other two areas in any order you want. Yeah. Um, so I did, I think, the much harder area second. And navigationally, I just found this area an absolute mess. Like, it was so... It had element aspects that were incredibly linear, and then you'd get to, like, a door, and then it'd be like, right, but you need the four things to get through this door. And then... The, the teleportation mechanics get back to the area where you need to then work out where the doodad is is very clunky and then okay. trying to read the map and work out where the thing is and i looked it up online on one of them and one of them is so well hidden that i was like that like that that should be like a hidden thing in this game it shouldn't be like a main main thing that you need to proceed which i oh, was that, that one of the mandatory ones one of the mandatory ones oh, yeah there wow. was like two of them were really difficult to find the other two i found okay but two of them were like i'm impressed you did it without a guide in me there because they're like I, honestly like the fact that you bring this up i don't remember this at all which says to me that i had no issue with it at all basically i mean it was like you played like four years ago but i do yeah. hear what you're saying but like yeah it just felt very frustrating and a little bit antiquated and just a bit interesting uh, because that's where this game is so good is like it's combat the combat feels it's great so and good like, i was saying to you where the, there's like a delay to the combat where it's it's not a chess match but it's more slow and deliberate than it necessarily looks it's almost like a turn-based battle right where like almost. you go in for a couple of hits and you know you can't get the third one so you have to dash out as right. they do their animation and then you can dash back in and attack again to finish it off basically but you can't like hades i feel like you can you can dash twice in hades as fast as you want like the, yes. that second dash will come out the second you press the button in hyperlight drifter the first dash will come out but then you can't get that second dash until there's like a delay and the delay makes you have to be a lot more strategic about the way that you fight enemies now you might think oh but surely you'll just get bombarded by enemies but they're on a similar delay like everyone's on this weird kind of physics based delay where you are kind of chess piecing it around the the area taking out enemies very strategically 
and it does feel really good and i think the bosses play into that really nicely as well like, they're so good yeah incredibly well designed bosses and the final area i actually really liked and in a similar way to a game like kana the final area splits its bosses into like three main bosses which i thought was interesting and those three bosses were actually really tough um but that's where i have another nitpick with the game is that the 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 checkpointing can be difficult and what i mean by that is like there's a finite amount of health resources health pickups so you lose mm-hmm. health if you want if you want to regen your health you have to go you have to get a finite pickup and then boost it otherwise you have to go back to like a main area if that makes sense you have to go back to like the original starting area yeah otherwise you've got a finite amount of pick health like regen pickups to regenerate your health so if you go into a boss fight with only like one little thing and it's kind of like a game like all these games do it now but like the souls idea where you've got like these things that boost your health and tunic does it hollow knight does it where you you've you've got a, a finite amount of things that you can boost your health mid battle it kind of does that the number of pickups you can get to boost your health is finite meaning that you can go into a battle with only one or two pickups when you could have been holding about five and then you fight the battle you die and when you restart that battle again you've only got two rather than right. five so yeah. You can screw yourself a bit where you get to that checkpoint. You've not got as many health pickups as you w- ideally would like. And then you're taking on like one of the hardest bosses in the game. And it's, right, it's like, okay. Like, so there's that frustration of, damn it, I wish there were... And the, in the game's defense, for the final boss and for like big, big, big bosses, they'll have like a little room before a checkpoint with like loads of pickups that you can just, you can fully amp your character in terms of regenerative like potion things and then go into the boss fight so it's just that but there's a couple where they don't do that and it's a lot more like oh damn this is this boss is kicking my ass and i'm not healing as much as i'd like and i don't Mm. really have a way of getting out of this easily which is a shame because the game game's combat is so good and the the bosses are really really satisfying to fight and um it'd be nice to have i ended up defeating like two out of those three really tough bosses in the final area with like less than a third of the pickups i ideally wanted and just kind of oh wow forced my way through it but um i would have preferred to be able to as a result i found those bosses harder than like the final boss oh wow um, okay huh so it's stuff like that that i wish was just a little more elegantly designed but yeah. other than those nitpicks i think this game is really cool i never really vibed with the design of the world and the, the design of the characters and that kind of thing and they I, I did say this to you, but I do think games like Death's Door, Tunic, um, Unsighted, I think as mechanically strong as those games are, as well as Hyperlight Drifter, I think their like story and world worlds are so much more my cup of tea and more interesting yeah. than what Hyperlight is going for. Totally. Um, and but I, again, this game's the first out of all that. Those three examples I've given, like this game was doing it right. quite a few years before. I mean, yeah, clearly games. very inspirational for Death Store. Right? Yeah, like, massively. You can, you can see a lot of the DNA um, kind of bleed over. And uh, yeah, I, I do think Hyperlight Drifter was, I think, as a kind of starting point for this type of like more action-focused Zelda experience, I think it's definitely one of the uh, one of the kind of best ones out there, um, you know, when it first came out. But you're right, there's there's been kind of a lot of that type of game since then. And some leaning in different directions. Like, I would say that Tunic and Unsighted lean a bit more into the puzzle side of things when it comes to, like, Zelda-style games. Yes. Uh, whereas Hyper Light Drifter was always a bit more Zelda 1 in that it was pretty purely combat-focused um, and kind of navigational, as you, as you were saying. Um, and that's what I think Death Door is much more as well, which is very combat-focused and navigational. Mm. So, um which I tend to prefer Tunic and Unsighted versus Death Door and Hyperlight Drifter. So I, I, I would kind of like more personally lean in that direction. Um, and I think Hyperlight Drifter surprised me just because for being a game like that that doesn't have more puzzle solving elements, I was really impressed by like how in, in, enamored I was by the combat and, and by all that stuff. So, yeah. yeah, it's, um, it, it's really cool. And, you know, they, they did that 3D game last year, which is coming to Game Pass. Yeah, Solar Ash, yeah, which Solar I really want to play. Which, um, people compare it a lot to The Pathless, and I'm like, wow, because I absolutely love The Pathless. And I think a lot of, The Pathless went under a lot of people's radar, unfortunately. So I'm looking forward to playing Solar Ash and Hyperlight Drifter is getting a direct sequel, right? It's on, on, in yes, the Hyperlight Breaker, I believe. Breaker. 
which is a uh, 3D game as well. Oh, it's 3D, uh, right. And that's next year, probably? I think it's going into early access next okay, year. Right. So it's going to be a little while until it has a full release, but I believe it's going to be like a 3D action roguelike, basically. So it's not going to be along the same lines as the original game. It's, it's going to be more... Um, you know, that's why they've gone into early access, I guess, because it's a roguelike. It makes sense to do that type of game um, going through early access. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very interested to see how that, that goes down. Because if they can translate the type of the combat from the original game into you know 3d setting i think that could be a really exceptional really fun thing to play mm. so mm. um yeah i'm looking forward to it but uh yeah glad that you uh checked yeah. this one out and knocked um, off another game on on our top 50 games of all time that i've not played right. yeah, um, yeah, yeah i should say i'm also i mentioned before i am chipping away at dead cells occasionally so that's another oh, game okay. that's in our top 50 that you yeah. played that i hadn't so hopefully by the time we get to our next top 50 there'll be very few games that i've not played potentially yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. see. I just need to stop playing new ones that you haven't in the meantime. <laughs> uh, Bali, you know that Xenoblade 3 is going to be like, you know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be like uh, dragging my heels. Uh, Xenoblade 3, yeah. Because Xenoblade 2 didn't make, didn't make the cut at no. all, did it? No, he didn't push for it. And I mean, like, talk, you know, talking about it now, and like as Devin was playing through and chatting to me about it, I'm like, yeah, Xenoblade 2 kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't suck. Like, I think I would still put it in my top 100 games of all time, probably, just purely for like the music and the combat is so fucking good. Like, there's an argument to be made that Xenoblade 2 has the best soundtrack in any game ever made like it is absolutely jaw drop like consistently across the board just like incredible stuff like the level of musicality in that game is astonishing um but there are lots of elements that i was like this fucking it's garbage i hate it uh so yeah it's 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 interesting and you know uh, i'll we'll see how i go with xenoblade 3 i think it's going to be hard to top the first game for me because it's so rooted in nostalgia and like my love for that plot and those characters like and the world is just so fucking incredible um and again the the soundtrack is my favorite all, to, all time so like topping xenoblade one is almost next to impossible well but um, you've got 44 weeks to think about it because that's when yeah. our next oh um, great thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks for putting a time on that lovely um well yes uh that's that sounds good and i'm sure we'll uh, we'll have some lively debates when that happens but uh, that's uh, a while away uh, and what is not a while away is our next segment so join us after the break where we will be going through some of your emails answering them, responding and giving you some uh, some fun things to talk about So, uh, see you in a bit Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of today's show. It is time for the emails. We got some good emails in there, Miz. Yeah, very, we do. I'm very happy. But we always need more. But we always need more. <laughs> if you would like to send an email to the show, please email this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. That is this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. We also have a channel over on our Discord server. You can drop an email, a question, a comment. A thought over there, and that's also much appreciated. Our first email this week is from Kamikaze Worm, who says, Hey guys, hope you're both doing well. Just thought I'd email in to talk about the Steam Deck. I recently purchased one and wondered what your thoughts were on its impact uh, for Nintendo and the Switch. I follow several Steam Deck groups, and I'm noticing a trend of people saying, apart from Nintendo first-party titles, there is no reason to use their Switch if they own a Steam Deck too. I completely get that Nintendo will have strong first party games which will always keep me in the nintendo universe however i'm noticing that now i can purchase indie titles on steam deck and they're usually cheaper than the nintendo version 
not to mention the AAA games that are not available for the Switch. Do you think it's a completely different demographic, or will this affect Nintendo in the long term? As always, keep up the good work. Thank you uh, for writing in. It's the question uh, of the moment. Yeah, it really is. It's an interesting one. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things to say about it. Uh, I really want a Steam Deck. Like, I have been seeing all the positive word of mouth about it. I kind of just wanted to... Like, initially, when it first went up, I tried to get in and get a pre-order in, but this thing broke on me, and I was like, uh, I think I had to, like, go out the door or something. I was like, all right, I'll just leave it and just see what people say about it. Are you not at the stage where you just want to wait for a version 2 yet? That, I mean, the question is how long, how long will that take? Like, you look at the chip shortage going on right now. We're still waiting for our play dates, for God's sake, you know? Like, there's, there's so so much issues when it comes to like sourcing parts and all these types of things that it feels like this will probably stick around for a while you know at least like four or five years before they do a new one it might be a bit shorter turnaround than that who knows where things happen but um i think that yeah i i definitely really want to get one and um and i think it's the perfect machine for someone like me right like yes i have an enormous steam library full of games that i haven't played yet full of games that frankly i would prefer to play handhelds you know and you love handheld gaming I absolutely love it. Like, it's the thing that uh, I gravitate towards the most. I usually am playing something handheld while watching a TV show or, like, having something on a YouTube video in the background. That's just how I operate generally. Um, So it is, it feels like it is the perfect device for me, especially when you consider, like, JRPGs that are only on PC, like the Trails in the Sky series that has not made its way to Switch yet. I think the Trails of Cold Steel stuff is on Switch at the moment, but the original Trails in the Sky, I've had it on pc for years and have not started it yet and i think part of it is like it's a big long rpg i would like to have it handheld um that would be a nice way to approach it so i'm almost almost saving some of those games for like when i do eventually get a steam deck which i think is inevitable i probably will get one eventually it's just it will take a long time to get one um functionally i think that the steam deck what it provides is like so far ahead and above of the switch in terms of power and in terms of accessibility to like a wide variety of games but also like the tinkering that you can do with it with emulation and all those sorts of things i would say like portability wise it's definitely look it's a handheld console but i wouldn't call it portable right i have held the steam deck uh we had one at work a dev kit and um thing is fucking wide supposedly not as comfortable as a switch would you agree I would say it's lighter than I expected it to be. Like, it's not as heavy as I thought. Um, It is comfortable to hold, but it's a big boy, you know? Like, you're going to... Your arms will get tired in bed holding this thing, right? It's it's not the sort of thing that you can whap out on a train on your commute every day. Um, You have to have it in a big... Uh, case and you probably have to have that case in a backpack and it's probably a bit of a pain to a faff to like get it out i mean that's what i do already with like my fixed dress one with my switch like it's a yeah. big case it's not really right. technically a handheld that i could get out on a train very easily but sure so i would i don't mind that portability size yeah i think and in terms of you know if you're going on a plane that's totally fine because like it's a much longer journey and like you have the kind of space the room to to play it then i think for plane journeys especially long ones that makes a lot of sense but my everyday commute like my ambonic is my go-to thing i basically just have whatever game i'm chipping away at on that thing playing um when i'm doing that because literally slips in and out of my jacket pocket right so so simple um which i can't do with any other handheld device uh and uh and yeah i think that's one of the stumbling blocks that it comes across the major thing at the moment is the fact that it is not very viable to get one if you're a regular consumer you know Let, let's why don't we why don't we put context to this question say steam deck say there was no chip shortage steam deck could make as many steam can make as many of it as they want at the moment yes yeah. maybe put the question in that context like the longer yeah. term yeah totally because right now you know you can't walk into a store and just buy a steam deck obviously you... no, no matter how successful it is or isn't like you just can't get one yeah, and, and obviously that you can kind of say the same thing for PS5 and Xbox right. at the moment, um, but that's just like a chip thing. I think in an ordinary situation, a regular consumer, you can't just walk into the store and get one. And you've heard people like Jeff Grubb talk about it where it doesn't sound like it's consumer ready, you know? Um, Gersman talked about this as well, of like, it, it feels like underbaked where... Destiny, Destiny 2, for example, is a game that you can't play on the Steam Deck. And if you're a regular consumer, you just want a device that you buy and you can play whatever game you have on Steam on it. And because of the compatibility stuff, because Linux is the basis for this um, this OS, not everything has compatibility at the moment. So there's, a, there's almost a tinkerer-level 
uh kind of approach you need to be that kind of consumer who is more into understanding of pcs and how they work even though it is a more streamlined experience in order to get the most out of the steam deck right now and you'd think a next version of it would be even more streamlined and more accessible and you know they yeah. might iron out these things I, th I think honestly the current steam deck can get there yeah. it's just a case of like making sure that all the big games when they come out are steam deck verified that everything in the back half, obviously not everything there are like hundreds of thousands if not millions of games on steam you know i see them every day there's garbage hentai stuff that gets uploaded every day to steam not every single one of those is going to have functionality nor should they because most people shouldn't play most of the trash that goes on steam every day um however uh, it does make sense for them to have a kind of wide spectrum of like you know destiny 2 should be playable it should be able to play overwatch it should be able to access everything <clears throat> you know easily um and and have all those games have compatibility and once we get to that point where you have a guaranteed like ability to play it that's when i think nintendo should start sweating at the moment i don't think they need to because their proposition their their offer is so much more streamlined number one it's a lot cheaper it's it, they have multiple options in terms of a more portable cheaper one for kids with the switch light um you know the the first party strength of their software means that they're always going to have interest in it from a you know software perspective nintendo are well positioned right and they're, and they're totally fine and they're doing exceptionally well in the market and part of that i think maybe the most important part of it is the ease of access the ease of access for switch you can buy cartridges and put them in your system you know that helps for certain people who still in this day and age there's still some people who don't go full digital right there's still a lot of people who um don't even connect their switch to the internet you know i, I mean, would we don't go full digital often because we like buying those hard yeah. copies because often they're still cheaper they're cheaper crazily yeah, enough. exactly which you know steam has an advantage where steam sales are concerned and the level of mm -hmm. discount you get in those is far superior to any first party nintendo game ever going on sale so that will always be an advantage for them but um you know hard drive space is an issue with the bigger games you know god of war i'm sure is a, a massive file size that will take up most of the space that you have so it's it's a lot more investment in terms of uh having some kind of like solution to to do that so i think right now nintendo shouldn't be scared but they should be they should be wary right they should be sweating yeah. because i think there is a real danger here for valve to swoop in and once they have a device that is more consumer ready that has like the accessibility has like maybe a more streamlined version as you say a, a steam deck version 2 that is smaller more portable um just a bit more comfortable and and less like kind of large and and cumbersome they could really shake things up in a way that obviously all those indie games come to pc first and they're often cheaper they're they are often obviously will always look better and, and on superior hardware will run better um that's kind of nintendo's bread and butter right now aside of their first party games indies are really what carries the switch and why it i think becomes so relevant for a lot of people um but if they lose that, then it's kind of dangerous alongside mm. the idea that you can play stuff like Elden Ring on the Steam Deck. You know, people were amazed that Breath of the Wild was a thing they could play at launch on Switch. It's like, I can take this to the toilet with me. I have this entire open world. Steam Deck is here. It has Elden Ring. It looks better. It runs better. It's the brand new open world game. It's a thing that everyone's talking about. That's dangerous for Nintendo. You know, like if people start to gravitate towards Steam and gravitate towards Valve and this as a device... I think that it could do some real damage um and nintendo need to find a, a differentiator right and they always do they usually are very good at finding like interesting angles and things with their hardware that makes them stand apart sometimes it works sometimes it very much doesn't and and causes big failures but um i, I think that they really would have to to find a way to make their device stand out because the reason they're able to compete with sony and microsoft right now is that differentiation of being portable that is the most important factor by far i, I disagree that portability is the biggest differentiator for nintendo at the moment between i, I do i 100 think that is the case i think the biggest differentiator is their first party output see that's that's important but wii u had phenomenal first party games and that did shit for the system not the same but but they didn't sell as well as the switch and there wasn't the same quantity right because the hardware was not was not interesting to people that's the core p problem and arguably that is partly because it's handheld but i don't think you'll ever 
finitely know that. No, I, I, I definitely disagree here. I think the portability is by far the most important aspect of the Switch. Why would you buy a Switch instead of a PlayStation? It's portability. It's it's also cheaper. It's also much easier. First party, very important. Probably the second most important thing. But number one most important thing in my mind for why the Switch is successful is that handheld and TV portability. Like the ability to switch it between them. I think we're talking um, at cross purposes where... Yes, the fact it's a great handheld is why it has sold well, but the stuff that has sold well on it is their first party, like 20 to 1 versus indie games, which is the only threat Steam Deck arguably has. Potentially. The other threat, as I said, is other AAA games, right? Because if you have the option, you know, Doom is on Switch. It's not very good, right? Doom is on Steam Deck. But the fact that games like Doom, Witcher 3, third party stuff is so sold so poorly on the Switch makes me think that like the steam deck has little to no threat to what nintendo's current marketing audience is for the switch yeah potentially um but also the the poor sales of those games on switch are as a result of them not being very good right like they're not very good versions of those games and if you have a place where very good versions of those games exist alongside a bunch of other stuff alongside and you shouldn't take this lightly emulation is a threat right a steam deck could very well run nintendo games through emulation it is extremely accessible extremely easy for people to download emu deck get things running and potentially run a switch emulator on a steam deck running brand new games better than a switch does right that is a threat and a danger it happened with ds ds was rife with easy access to flashcards and all that sort of stuff it was a huge problem for nintendo nintendo were extremely mad about it i'm sure it ate into a lot of their sales with ds because so many people when when piracy is accessible and easy it is a threat and a danger unless you offer a service that is better and nintendo you know often with their old games um especially you know when it comes to that that service you know you'll have a lot fewer people interested in doing that if they can do their old games on, on steam deck but also their modern games are a threat as well because they're underpowered like they're weaker things and so on a new iteration of steam deck a more powerful version of the hardware you can have yuzu running super mario 3d world plus bowser's fury on that thing and probably run it better than a switch and people are not above that and i think that is actually a big danger in all honesty emulation mm. is a threat and i think that steam deck can, uh, it, can yeah. threaten nintendo with that for sure i still so, don't um, think that the, the japanese executives at nintendo will be worried at all about steam deck mainly of course i mean they're very oblivious to a lot of things but this most of all true but i if indies played if indies were a bigger pillar in nintendo's sales output yeah i think they'd be more worried how many like how many indies are in the top 25 games of like sister of like copies sold for nintendo switch and the answer is like yeah a handful none none no i think stardew valley is i'm pretty sure like i think is stardew valley when they um, look at this i'm just looking at this wikipedia list is stardew valley sold more than 3.5 million on switch oh easily yeah I i think that with some of those games they i'm pretty sure that they don't use those when they're doing their big top 20 or whatever right i'm pretty sure that's just nintendo first party games or or published nintendo published games i think they put on that list maybe i'm wrong on that but i I always assumed that was the case they don't have like other games uh as a part of that even um, even still i do think of the top 20 because the vast majority are nintendo first party games yeah and switch aside from like legal emulation is the only place to play those games Mm -hmm. i don't see I don't see how Steam Deck affects that model other than the argument of everyone wants a really great handheld to play their games on. Because I think yeah. now that people have bought Switches and they're playing Nintendo first party games and everyone wants to play the sequel to Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild mm-hmm. 2, all these games that they can only get on a Switch, I think that the I think that the indie argument that we're talking about is a very niche audience in comparison to the overall sales market market of the switch like i i think to our audience and to the circles we're in it's a huge deal but i don't think to nintendo's bottom line 
indies make up this they're an important pillar but nowhere near as important as their first party output and the sales overall of the switch like i think yeah that's that's true and and i totally agree with that but i don't think we're talking about those in isolation right the danger of the steam deck is not just that it can play all the indie games first it's that it can play god of war first right like that's the real danger here is if you have but that was never a threat to nintendo because they were never ever going to have a system that played god of war like that that changes someone from buying a ps5 to buying a steam deck it doesn't necessarily change someone from buying a switch potentially potentially but like i think people if you're thinking about a regular consumer are you going to think about buying two handheld devices or both of which have a kind of similar power level um i think that's really where it comes down to i think the argument works against the steam deck because people will be like i just want a switch i don't think so I i think that if you if you're trying to compare apples to apples of two handheld devices you know you 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 get benefits from either one right switch has first party nintendo games steam deck has every triple a game under the sun that doesn't work on the nintendo system and so i think a lot of there are a lot of people who just own a switch right and if they could own a different device right one that is more powerful one that gives them access to a lot of game a lot of games much cheaper overall um you know if it if it is positioned correctly if it's priced correctly I think that is a danger, honestly. I think it is definitely something that they should be worried about. But um, but yeah, I think Nintendo will always have this kind of invulnerability when it comes to the quality of their software, right? You're never going to get like the high quality software that they have on a Steam Deck uh, unless you're emulating it, of course. Um, it's, it's just not going to happen and you're not going to get the kind of like the same streamlined uh experience when it comes to every game will just work out the box you know like these are things Mm. that steam deck has to work out that has to make sure um make sense um and i think within our circles it's probably a a lot louder because a lot of people in our circles are like annoyed with how weak the the switch is right now i don't Um, think there's a lot of people picking up steam deck yet who don't have a at least a chunky steam library and i think honestly i don't think nintendo have anything to worry about until someone like me would even consider buying a steam deck and even once Mm -hmm. i do i'm still someone who's happy to own like four or five games consoles and play stuff day one but but i think the danger is not me or you it's the people who only have one right and if you only have one and you want a handheld device that's where i think the danger is that's that's where i think because most of people um out there are are not going to have multiple consoles right like they are i also think nintendo have the kids market wrapped up and that takes up a huge chunk of the switch sales and i think for a lot of parents they'll be like right well the switch has all these nintendo games i know my kids will like versus steam deck which is aimed Mm -hmm. at a much older older audience and and the switch Lite as well is a great example of that right like they basically released that for pokemon because that audience who plays pokemon are going to want to do that right i think nintendo need to worry when steam deck launches a pastel array of steam decks aimed at a younger audience or something because i just think it's very i think the steam deck is is far more akin to the xbox series x ps5 audience than it is a nintendo Mm. switch audience at the moment it's at the moment it's it's trying to become a handheld version of those consoles right and yes it can play a bunch of indies that are on switch but i think that comparison is quite tangential really in terms of like audience no, that makes sense. I, I totally get that. Um, but I, I would say that I think five years down the line, this will be a much more interesting like landscape to look at because if seeing the current success of Steam Deck, right, if Valve really do get into putting it in Walmarts or whatever and having it more accessible and having a more streamlined, uh, better version, it also depends on what Nintendo do next, right? I think Steam Deck could sell 30, 40 million units and it still wouldn't affect Nintendo's bottom line. Yeah, potentially. And I think that's quite a likely outcome for the next five years. It, like, I, I think it also depends on what Nintendo do next, ultimately, right? Like, we know Nintendo... And we know what they're going to do next. They're going to do a more powerful Switch and we'd be shocked if they weren't. Well, we say that, we say that, we say that, but Nintendo, they fucking like to zig when you think they will zag. And I know... True, but they're going to delay that as long as possible as well because of this chip yeah. shortage and we have discussed that. But um, yeah. I... I if they zag when we think they're going to zig at this point in time, I think that'll be truly jaw-dropping because they've, they're onto such a winner. I would... Honestly, I would not put them above it. I just don't. Just never, ne- never think Nintendo are going to do the thing you think they're going to do because they often don't. They often will just do a stupid thing and you're like, why the fuck? But also that's interesting because... But every uh, time they've historically been on a winner, they do an iteration of the winning thing. It's only they when do. their back's against the wall they normally do the most radical exactly. thing. Exactly, right. And, and the Super Nintendo is a great example of like great iteration on that. Right. 
3ds ds yep but which ultimately every time they have done an iteration it has been less successful the super nintendo sold less than the NES. i I think that nintendo will i think the the sequel to the switch will definitely be less successful than the switch a bit like ps5 to ps4 but i think they will happily take that knowing that it's a successful idea that doesn't necessarily even need to be more successful than the switch to be the second most successful nintendo Mm. um system of all time so i think that I'd be I'd be truly shocked. I think you would be too if they did something that was away from the Switch in terms of like it. Oh, I think it would be extremely boneheaded and fucking stupid if they did, right? Yeah. Like, but you're right. If they do do something boneheaded and stupid, I do think that you're right. That opens some sort of pseudo window for a Steam Deck to yeah take up a bit. But yeah, and I think that Furukawa as a president is definitely he's more of a businessman, right? Like he he came from Nintendo of Europe doing more of that stuff, less with the developer hat that Iwata had, the kind of like crazy like almost magical uh uncle nintendo kind of uh vibe that i think the company had under his leadership and it feels like for is taking a more straightforward approach to kind of growing the company and like doing True. what the next steps would be with it right um N- so. nintendo has led the handheld market for over 30 years the entire existence of the handheld market yeah the entire existence and they've seen off sony they've seen off sega they've seen off uh-huh. other huge video game companies playstation tried with psp and vita exactly and, yeah, like failed. and sure valve's going to come along but i guarantee you they will see off the steam deck and it will It'll, it might do very well for itself, but I, I guarantee yeah. it won't impact the bottom line much of Nintendo. Yeah. Ultimately, I think you're right at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Like, Nintendo just have such a strong hold on this market. And and that's because of form factor of their systems. It's because of yeah. their child-based audience for a lot of the system. And it's because of mm-hmm. familiarity as well. Yeah, uh, 100%. Uh, I just think that they should maybe... They should maybe keep an eye on it you know (laughs) like don't don't get too complacent uh which always happens in the games industry every time a company is uh you know successful the next time round they are complacent and they fuck up a bunch of stuff um and it's a tale as old as time and it keeps happening uh so you know we'll see they're on top of the world right now they might not be soon very good question though that that was from kamikaze spark spirited debate which is always what i like to see our next email is from noah from halifax in nova scotia Good day, Bally and MZ. Greetings from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I hope you're both well. Have either of you ever completely avoided playing a game that you were interested in simply due to its length? Mm. A couple of months ago, I picked up a copy of Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate on the Switch for a good price at a local game shop without knowing anything about it. Having heard good things about the Monster Hunter series but never having played one, I figured I would give it a try. Upon getting home with the game, I looked it up on how long to beat and found its length to be 78 hours for the main story and 175 hours for main story and extras. My stomach dropped upon seeing these numbers. I'm someone who, like Bally, takes my time with games and tries to experience as much as I can, so I know my playtime with the game would have been closer to 175 hours. Instead of adding the game to my never-ending backlog, I decided to be rid of it altogether without even putting the game in my Switch. I told it on I sold it on Facebook Marketplace shortly thereafter. I simply don't have time or energy to, energy to sink into games like I used to when I was in my teenage years. Has anything like this ever happened to you? Cheers, Noah. Thanks, Noah, for writing in. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. I want to shout out the website How Long to Be, one of my favorite websites in the world. Absolutely love it um yeah i mean like i can't remember when i discovered it but it must have been like maybe five six years ago it popped up and i think since then it has gained notoriety within the industry a lot of people reference it all the time um constantly anytime something uh, comes out a new game i will always just look it up on how long to be just to get a good sense of like the gamification of playing games is an important (laughs) pillar in us analyzing yes how long something will take to be and factoring that into our lives yeah games are this unique medium where like you know every movie is about an hour and a half to three hours long there's really not much variation but it's like okay this this game took me 30 minutes this one took me 300 hours yeah. uh you know like the, you can't really equivocate in that way uh, games are just very different there's not even arguably a sweet spot with video games like triple a's no. vary in length drastically and even the shorter games can vary in length drastically and one is not necessarily more successful than the other like it really yeah. is completely open how long a game can be 
yeah i think it also depends on what your commitment to it is as well right like i saw all the reviews for xenoblade 3 being like it's 150 hours and instead of me being like oh god that's so much time i was like yes give it to me i will immerse myself in this world for those hours and i will love every second right so it, it i think it depends on what you're coming to the game with and what your attitude towards it is you know um if someone says that the sequel to breath of the wild is 200 hours i'd be like well let's go boys here we are let's just sink into this for three months and play nothing else um but again, I think for us, it's a little trickier because we always want to be playing something new every time we uh, go on the show. So it's hard to have those big, like, you know, get, I think getting into Monster Hunter for us has always been like, oh, we should do that at some point. But I think everything that puts us off it is, well, we have to dedicate a lot of time to it. We have to, like, mm-hmm. put a lot of effort on our side. But also, I know that those games are extremely long. So it is a barrier to entry for certain. Like, you saying it's 78 hours for main story, I'm like okay, like, yeah, I could play that to the kind of detriment to every other game that I'm interested in right now, and maybe I'll like it, maybe I'll enjoy it, but um, is that worth me putting that investment in in the first place? And that's where it gets tricky, I think. Um, I had a recent example of this where um, Omori came to Game Pass. I was like, great, Omori, heard great things about it. It's like Undertale. In my mind, I was like, oh yeah, that's like a five, six hour game, right? Like, it'll be great. I'll just go through it. It's going to be really interesting and subversive and, you know, very cool narratively. And I went to How Long to Beat to just check, like, okay, yeah, how long is it um and it was like 25 hours i was like yeah i don't know if i want to start that now you know like i've got a lot of stuff on <laughs> like it's quite a long game i didn't realize omori was like a 25 hour rpg i was like oh okay well i will get to this I'll, I'll definitely play it at some point but like seeing that number and it being so far from my what my expectation was was really jarring in a way that just immediately as soon as i downloaded it i was like let's jump into this tonight let's you know i'm sure i'll just start it off and you know get in and i'll be done by the end of the week and um no that wasn't the case i was like oh okay this is actually this is actually extremely long in a way that uh i and it's not super long either like that's quite short for an rpg but i think especially for for indie games like for shorter games i i tend to find that anything over 15 hours is unusual you know you get stardew valley and, and hollow knight and things like that which you just go past that but usually i think the thing i love about independent games is they are quite small in scope and they they usually only go you know maximum of 10 hours for uh, for a lot of them and so seeing something that's like oh no it's like close to 30 um usually for me is something that just it makes me think twice you know it's i'm I'm still gonna play omori i'm still interested in it but i think it it just kind of almost shoves it down the hierarchy right like i have a hierarchy of games i'm interested in and as soon as you say well you're 70 hours long and i'm kind of interested in you but you know i'm just gonna kind of shove you down the hierarchy uh, and it doesn't make mm-hmm. as much sense um and that can change over time, right? Like, when Yakuza Like a Dragon came out, people were like, this is an 80-hour game. I was like, oh, that's a lot of time. I don't know. I don't know about this. And then I played the rest of the Yakuza games. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to spend 80 hours in the Yakuza game. So I'm absolutely in for that now. So my, you know, expectations change over time depending on, like, how deep into a series you get. You know, for example... If I hadn't played Xenoblade before and Xenoblade 3 was coming out, it was 150 hours, I would be like, I don't have time for that. I'm not going to play that, right? But because I'm a fan of the series, I'm willing to to get into it because it's something that I'm interested in. Um, yeah. Do you have any examples, Bally, of, of stuff that you have thought, so yeah, many. I'll play that, and then, oh no, it's it's too many hours long? I have so many systems I already do to like plan the games that I'm playing. So for those who don't know, I have like a Google Doc and it's like Bally Games Play 2022. And I've got like a list of games that I want to play in 2022 that are coming out. And I list them with their dates when they come out. I've got a list of games that I'm currently playing. I've got a list of games I want to get to. And I've even started putting on the how long to beat figure as to like how many hours they are. And I'll have a group of games that are the ones I'm about to play. And then I'll have a group of games that are games that are longer. And then I put the how long to beat on those as well. So I... I, I categorize my games into like long games and not long games basically and this is all made more important by the fact that ballet jr came along and basically wiped away all my gameplay time yeah so yeah, all gone now. i basically more or less have an hour to an hour and a half and if i'm lucky two hours two and a half hours to play a day i can never go above that and if i choose to go under that i lose that gameplay for the day basically like i can't gain it back at the weekend or something like that's my my time for the day so between shows i at the low end can only ever play about 14 hours of games between shows um 
So what happens now is that I've made myself a rule where I try to only play one long game at a time. Now, having right now, as I'm saying that, I've already broken making the good that decision rule. to uh, start on Elden Ring, of course. Yeah, I'm playing Elden Ring in the background. Meanwhile, I've started Live Alive. Elden Ring is 150 hours. El- uh, Live Alive is supposedly about 21. So they would both be categorized as long games in my kind of system, but. I'm confident I can manage two at once for the time being at least and talk about Live Live next time. But anyway, it does mean that any time a game is over like 20 hours, 25 hours, it just gets put on that like long list. And a game like CrossCode, I've been meaning to play for ages now, like a a year or two. And it's over, I think it's like a 35, 40 hour game. Mm -hmm. And it's on my long list. Like I can't play that game until... I've got a long game gap, as it were. Like, Elden Ring has to be beaten, but when Elden Ring gets beaten, there might be another long game I'd rather play, you know? So it that list, it's tougher to be played if you're a long game. You have to be really good, and you have to be really relevant, and you have to be really high up on my list of games I want to play, whereas short games... I'm, as long as like price isn't an issue for a game or something, I'll be like, yeah, I'll just hit that out three, four hours, whatever. Let's, let's play a bit of that, and like... I agree. Monster Hunter is a great example of a series I probably would be interested in, but just doesn't work at all. Um, likewise, like I obviously bounced off Xenoblade uh, X massively, but I'd like to try Xenoblade 2 one day, but I just kind of don't want to because of its length, really, and it kind of like makes me bounce off it honestly at this point i would say i would say just go to three three. you don't don't need to play two and already so far from what i've been playing of three i think you will enjoy three massively more than two anyway well maybe i should just go to three then but again that's still a hundred hour game that i need to like factor in so another good example this year is triangle strategy like i really enjoyed that demo i want to play that game but I, it just got beaten out by like Horizon Forbidden West at the time, and right. I just couldn't justify playing two long games at once. Now, do you? Yeah, do you see yourself changing your attitude towards finishing games? Like with your lack of time to like put, you know, enough to finish all these games into. Do you see yourself in the future just you know playing something and not worrying too much about finishing it, and just like having that as an kind of approach? Part of the process of playing games and making these lists is I really do enjoy making our like top 10 games list at the end of the year so Mm -hmm. i always do my top 10 games that didn't come out this year but i also do the top 10 that did come out this year i wouldn't feel right or confident or happy about the fact of putting in a game i hadn't beaten in a top 10 list personally everyone's yeah everyone's justification is different but my personally wouldn't like that so if i'm choosing not to beat a game uh that can't say came out this year that's me ex- accepting that it's not going to be my top 10 i would be prepared to do that in probably an extreme circumstance uh but by and large i like to beat it so i have a full understanding of where it will rank because mm. I, I might like yeah. the option of being able to slide it into number 10 for example i wouldn't like want my number 10 to be a game i've not beaten personally and yeah sure. even with bally jr like i do want to manage to keep up with enough games where I can hopefully put together a decent list and and it, for it to be a proper list of games that I have played and completed. And yeah, so I my attitude might change slightly, but there are so many games that the qual I'm barely ever playing a game that's not a 9 or 8 out of 10. I'm yeah, barely totally. ever. And I have no reason to not finish a game that's a 9 or 8 out of 10, to be honest, because I'm in, I'm, I'm usually enjoying it too much. Right. So. I think the only difference comes in if the game is super short and you're just playing it because it's super short. You know, like a great example from this year is A Memoir Blue, where I played it because it was super short. And from what I'd heard, it wasn't amazing. And I played it and I was like, yeah, that wasn't amazing. And it was on Game Pass. I think that combination yeah. is powerful right. to be like... It's, it's very powerful. Right, yeah. let's give it a go. It's... It, I, I could even play this game without reading a review. It's that short, you know? I'll just yeah, give exactly. it a go. Right. Um, and I, I think that can be detrimental, right? Like, I think just playing a short game just because it's short can be not great because it is still like an hour or two hours that you're kind of not wasting but like you could have put that towards something else right and yeah. there are moments where i've done that where i've just played a short game because it's short um or like you want that number of games you've beaten to be higher you know and it's yeah like... exactly which i don't i you know i've climbed that fucking mountain i beat 78 <laughs> games last year i don't need to like really 
go ham. If I was ever struggling to fill a top 10, I might be more inclined to play a memoir blue or yeah, something, you know, yeah. just so I can say, right. here's a game that came out this year. I played it. It's I didn't, So you can technically just like put it on the end. Exactly. Because yeah. I never want to have a list that's only eight games and I'm going to far surpass 10 games again this year. So I'm not worried about that now. Yeah, which is very, very impressive given the lack of time you have. Very. Yeah, impressive. and like I still, like, I think... Long, if there's a long game I want to play, uh, even with Bally Junior, I've got my slots to play it, and I did that with Horizon Forbidden West. I still yeah, sunk Jesus Christ, seventy five hours into that game, and that game came out before he was born, and I played ninety percent of it after he was born. And yeah. I'm very proud of myself for doing that, and it kind of just worked out with the whole routine I've got with Caroline and the time that I look after him at night and when he's asleep, when he's awake, it just kind of works out. And that's mm-hmm. kind of, that's how I'm going to play Elden Ring as well. It just kind of like yeah. works out, but for sure. that's how I, I only ever play games now between 10 PM and midnight. That's my only pl- time to play. play the twilight games. hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's very different to where I was before. So yeah, long games, you've got to be quality. You've got to be something I'm excited about. And I was excited about Forbidden West for a long, long time. And I was very impressed by the reviews and bought it day one. I dropped the massive 70 quid on it, which is just insane. Um, But you know what? That game was worth the 70 quid I spent on it. And likewise, God of War Ragnarok will be another like 70 quid game I'll get day one. But those those games are pretty rare in like the Sony first party kind of thing and they often are mm-hmm. quite long games but you know they're worth it i'll do the same with breath of the wild too you know like yeah when the course. game is good enough and long enough like i can still make if you want to play it, i can still make the time and i'm feeling that way about elden ring although i'm only about four or five hours in but you know that'll that'll take off i'm enjoying it so far and and we'll keep going yeah exactly and, and yeah that, and that's what it comes down to i think at the end of the day is like our count only matters as much as you care about the game itself you know like i think long hour counts are much harder when you're looking at something that you're interested in but you don't you don't have that commitment yeah to, right whereas with you can't get away with being a seven <laughs> yeah exactly but with with stuff like zelda and stuff like xenoblade for me it's just like well i'm so committed like this is the reason i play video games these are the things i i love uh, the most and and that's why i want to have the most out of them possible which is why you know i have put 17 hours into xenoblade and why i want to wrap up the show now so that i can go play more of it you know like that's the the reason that um you know I, i'm very into games is it games like that when they come along and they hit in that special way um that's you know that's what i'm here for so um our account doesn't matter at that point you know i don't want it to be as, as long or short as it needs to be and and that's that's what it is at the end of the day but um yeah i don't think i've ever taken a game back after buying it then realizing it and then and then uh you know wanting to uh, abandon it usually no. i think these days because you know we're very much aware of how much time we put into stuff it's often like i will always do that research first omori yes. just happened to be one of those things where i was interested in it and it was on game pass so I, I didn't like actively make a choice to buy it um and so i saw it and i was like oh okay this is actually longer than i wanted it to be um but i'm sure i'll get around to it at, at some point and uh yeah and I, and I do think it can it can backfire in the opposite way where if it is a you know chasm's a good example i didn't talk about chasm on this show i've actually dnf'd dnf is a term i got from booktube uh means does not finish um or did not finish uh i i dnf'd chasm because i mean that term itself is from marathon running but okay <laughs> oh, okay yeah sure i mean th- i i heard it on booktube Bali. okay that's where it originated from in my mind uh so so yeah i um i decided you know that game was it was like six seven hours long i was like yeah this is kind of okay ish and then the more i played it, i was like oh this is frustrating and annoying and doesn't feel very good and i just found i was putting hours into it for the sake of having to finish it and as soon as that happens you realize no this is a bad idea let's just stop uh, and I, I try and not be beholden anymore in that way you know if i'm just done with something i'm just like no, i'm fucking done now so i'm just gonna leave it so um yeah that's basically how things can shake out so it's not really worth putting in even if it is a short game sometimes it's just better just to take that time back for yourself you know um and, and do something else with it so that's sure. that's kind of the approach um, yeah thank you yeah. very much for your email noah that's that's another good one um as i said at the top of the segment we are always wanting more emails if you would like to send an email to the show please email this nintendo life at gmail.com that's this nintendo life at gmail.com or you can leave a comment in our channel on our discord server we mm-hmm. would usually appreciate that 
Absolutely. Uh, and that, everyone, is going to bring us to the end of the show today. Thanks, everybody, for listening, sticking with us, uh, and, and all that good stuff. Um, it's uh, I'm going to see if I can finish Xenoblade by the next show. I don't know if I will. You know, the amount... Good God. <laughs> the amount of side stuff that I'm doing right now, uh, I can see myself putting the 150 hours in. Um, and, you know, I've got a whole week, so... Do the maths on that, like, hours in the day versus uh-huh. you playing it again, and, yeah, yes. we'll see yeah we'll see we'll see how that uh, shapes out but uh looking forward to it regardless i hope everyone else is as well i know a lot of our community uh, people wait so like so you're off for like I don't know, 10 days uh-huh yeah even if you did 10 so you're 17 hours in yes even if you did 10 hours a day right that you're getting to like 117 hours yeah i, I i'm not gonna hit 150 hours so in it, this week so. if yeah if you want to do all the size stuff you do and you think that'll take yeah. you 250 hours, I, I'd be truly shocked if you did all of that. Also, apparently, the people who did 150 hours in this game have said there's post-game content that is very important and also you should play oh, as well. God. So so it's never-ending. And also, they're doing an expansion pass, so there's going to be a, a tournament-sized DLC coming next year. I'm I'm eating good, by the Fire <laughs> Emblem is here. Xenoblade is here. This is my shit. I am so excited. I'm so happy. So I'm um, looking forward to it. But... Um, uh, you can find us and you can find me mainly tweeting about Xenoblade and nothing else right now uh, on Twitter at LordNBZ. Where can they find you, Bally? I'm on Twitter at BallyMan91. That's B A W L Y M A N 91. And I even tweeted a video of me getting my first crown, and you can see how crazy fluky I was with the way it was the, really good. The stage just walloped me to the end. Yeah, that balance that you had was fantastic. <laughs> it was awesome. I really enjoyed watching that. I was like, how is he going to do this? I, when it happened, then it like, live time i was like oh my god oh my god oh my god yeah you're probably internally screaming like i can't fuck this up now this is my chance (laughs) Uh, and and you took it it's pretty amazing uh bali also on twitter you turned me on to this guy who wears weird costumes oh my god (laughs) and does violin uh he basically plays the violin violin along to a game but not just doing the music every time like an action happens like getting a coin or something in a game he will play that on the violin it's fucking incredible uh so he's only got like sixty thousand followers this guy deserves millions i tell you You oh my god him. it's astonishing it's so fucking good so yeah go to bally's twitter for that as well um for all other stuff you can go to the uh tnl uh twitter which is at tnl podcast um and yeah uh tweeting out whenever shows go live also uh tweeted out that old video we did on xenoblade x where bally said it was his favorite open world back then uh this was my, also uh, my, my my second open world i think right after, it was like, yeah Creed. exactly and it was like a day before breath of the wild came out oh my so god that was, uh, yeah. funny um but yes uh it's uh definitely a thing you can go and look in the archives of some old videos that we did as well on the channel which is uh you can go to youtube.com slash uh, i think this nintendo life yes um, and uh, yeah you can you can find the podcast there as well as you know other older videos that we've done and uh, obviously join the discord which is linked in the description uh we have a xenoblade 3 channel we have a xenoblade general channel um where a lot of people are playing the game and uh chatting about it in there so join along if you're interested uh have have other people to chat to and figure out the battle system and all that good stuff it'll be a good time um Obviously, uh, we are funded and supported by some wonderful folks over on Patreon, patreon.com slash this Nintendo life. Uh, we have some folks to thank Bally for supporting the show. Yes, thank you to our $10 tier patrons. They are Zach S, Atari Alex, Thomas, Matthew and Albert. Thank you all for your $10 tier support, but thank you to all of our other patrons. It's hugely appreciated uh, the support you give us. We, we, yeah, we really absolutely. appreciate it yeah definitely and um we uh obviously have bonus shows that you can get as a result of supporting that where we talk about other stuff uh, that we've been playing uh, prepare to hear my diatribe on why power wash simulator is the game of the year very soon uh, i'm sure i'll be chatting that. about that uh yeah so and my elden ring check in god i gotta, gotta yeah. check back in absolutely um so yeah you can find all that stuff over there uh, if you are so inclined and yes again thank you for everyone for supporting us there you can find the show in various places we're on the internet we're on spotify we're on stitcher uh, you can download us if you just have a podcast app and search for this nintendo life we should show up there and you can subscribe and that means you get the show um you know whenever it comes out every couple of weeks uh, as well as if you're on spotify you can uh, give us a star rating on there um and uh, that is really beneficial that really helps to kind of get the word out to people who might not have uh, heard 
about the show before and are interested in some Nintendo chat. Thanks to all the star ratings so far. It's really, really great. We've got a few. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and even if you don't use Spotify, it's very simple. You just go over there, you play one of the episodes for like a couple of minutes, and then you get the option to rate it. I believe you can still only do it in the app, so you have to go through the Spotify app on your phone uh, to do it that way. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it's a good way, I think, for them to kind of get uh, some different shows out there, and, and uh, it'd be very nice if people could support us on that that'd be great and if you found us on Sp- spotify welcome <laughs> yeah and also let us know yeah be good yeah. to hear uh, join the discord you know come in and, and chat with us it's it's all a great time so fantastic uh i think that is pretty much going to wrap us up for today's show bally uh i just need to get out of here and go play elden uh, not elden ring i mean i'm done with that you <laughs> need, need to go, to go out of here and play elden, elden ring <laughs> i'm gonna go play xana blade 3 which is both gonna just dive into big big worlds and uh do nothing else so uh it's gonna be a good time and uh yeah we'll uh see you very soon thanks everybody for listening um, Bye-bye. interlude used on today's show was the boss theme from Xenoblade Chronicles 3, copyright Monolith Soft and Nintendo 2022. Does Discord like Discord does a good job of getting rid of background noise, but it's annoying when I'm like, I need to clap to hear the other person to make sure it's working. Uh and it wasn't, so I know I, I know I'm um biased, but yes. the number of times Discord seat sounds like it crashes and shit with like podcasts I listen oh, right, to and yeah. it's like yeah, Skype doesn't do that. <laughs> yeah, Skype actually is kind of stable. It kind of works still. Uh, Maybe that's because no one's on it. <laughs> Maybe. But like the, that podcast the I love, Into the Aether, uh, they w- they were mentioning that they record on Skype as well. I was like, okay, someone else still does it. Okay, we're good. We're good. All right, cool. Uh, yeah. We're not the last people using Skype.